Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. Today is March 6th, 2024. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Manny, uh, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? How you doing? I'm Manny Cortez. I uh, was born and raised in the Bronx, New York. Um, a founding member of Driven by Hatred and a member of many other Bronx bands over the years. And uh, yeah, that's that. Great. Um, Manny, you want to start off by talking about your family history and background and whatever you might know about how your family ended up in the Bronx? Yeah, so um, my parents are both originally from the Bronx. My dad was born, I believe it might have been Fordham Hospital. Okay, okay, yeah. Which is no longer there. Yeah, (laughs) no longer there. My mom was born in the Bronx also. I forget the name of the place, but it's also a hospital that's no longer around. Yeah. Um, My dad was... uh, one of eight and a uh, big family. He was a musician at an early age also, played guitar, sang. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say play, still does play guitar still and sings. Guitar, yeah, he's a yeah. singer songwriter prim- primarily. Um, my mom is the oldest of four. She was uh, uh, basically grew up with her brothers, you know, uh, my uncles and stuff. They met and, uh, you know, uh, it was a love story and they had me. <laughs> Do you, do you know much about where um, your how your mo- mother and father's family ended up in the Bronx as far as what generation uh, in the Bronx and all of that? So my grandmother on my mom's side, I believe, uh, well, she definitely came over from Puerto Rico. I don't know. Man, I should have brushed up on the family history. No, that's bit. fine. <laughs> I don't know uh, too much of the history of, of um, about when she came over and stuff. I know... My grandparents uh, weren't together when I was a kid, so yeah. it was always my grandmother and, and uh, like a step grandfather, who you know I knew his grandfather. But um, yeah, I didn't know too much about them. Uh, same thing with my my dad's parents. Um, I'm not sure when my my grandparents came over. My dad's dad, biological, I, I never knew. Uh, again, it was like a step grandfather that I grew up with. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know too much about the, uh, the history beyond my parents, you know? Sure. And what, what parts of the Bronx did your grandparents live in when you were growing up? You so, um, originally, I know, I, I believe my mom was over by Walton Avenue. Okay. Like okay. That, that section. Sure. My dad and his family grew up in the building I grew up in. So that was on uh, Park mm-hmm. Avenue in the Bronx between 178th and 179th. Oh, okay. So, right, there's like the uh, Metro North that runs through there. Yep, yep, yep. So, um, when they had gotten married and had me, I believe they had a, an apartment over by Kingsbridge. Okay. And uh, were there probably till I was maybe two years old and then moved back to that block that oh, my, nice. my dad's family uh, basically grew up on. So, the building I grew up in, um, my grandparents at the time were the superintendents oh, okay okay so okay, they ran it, it was kind of an isolated block because of the metro north line yeah and um the rest of park avenue the other two blocks around them were like all uh, uh warehouse buildings and stuff like that yeah so our one block had four buildings on that block and my grandparents were the superintendents of three out of four buildings wow. so it, it was pretty cool so Growing up, everybody on that block kind of knew each other. Yeah. Everybody, you know, like all the kids hung out outside, but they kind of stood on that block. Yeah, sure. On the opposite side of the street was uh, Webster Avenue. You had the projects there. and yeah. It was a whole other world over there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and you, you mentioned both your mom and, and dad came from pretty big families. Did your aunts and uncles live in the Bronx when you were growing up? For a while. So um, on my, my uh, mom's side, my... She was, like I said, the oldest of four, so I had my three uncles there. <clears throat> the oldest uncle, I mean, as a kid, they were all there in the Bronx, uh, in the Soundview area, over okay. on uh, Fitelli Avenue. Oh, Fitelli. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. So, you know, I'd hang out there a lot. But um, my oldest uncle wound up, uh, he, he was an artist, and he wound up moving out to Florida. He started an engraving business and stuff. Wow. Yeah, so, you know, he does that. Uh, the other two uncles were in the Bronx for a long time. The middle one eventually wound up going out to Florida too, and the youngest in Long Island. Um, my dad's family, they were all originally in the Bronx, but eventually wound up moving around also, mostly upstate. 
But growing up, it was pretty cool because a lot of them lived in my apartment building. So I, I had see. a lot of family there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. and uh, that that building, forget it. it. You know, I had my my grandparents downstairs who, like I said, were the superintendents. I had an aunt, I think, on the second floor. We were on the third floor. Uh, I had another aunt, aunt and uncle that were, I think, on the second floor also. <laughs> so, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah so as, as a kid, forget it, you know, like... It was great. I had tons of family around, you know, a lot of friends on the block. It, yeah. was, it was nice. But that apartment building was pretty cool. It was uh, very old, like uh, the railroad style apartments, oh, you know, okay. really long. Sure, sure. And it had a huge basement, which, of course, we had access to. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they were the superintendents. And uh, as a kid, my dad played in bands all his life. And the basement was like a studio, basically. Wow. So I, as a kid, I'd get to go down there and watch my dance, my, my dad's bands rehearse and stuff. So it was and, pretty cool. And uh, say a little bit more, at least whatever you know about your dad's musical journey. Like like we were talking before, this would be awesome to do an oral history with him too. But whatever oh, yeah. you heard yeah. about your dad's I'm sure he, musical history. He'd love history. it. So he, he played in... Various bands also. I know as a kid he had a band called the Velvet Soul. Oh, okay. That's a and band. yeah, <laughs> and and uh, you know, for their time they they were doing their thing. They were playing shows. Uh, they they won a battle of the bands that was uh, I believe held by like a, a Bronx group or maybe a Bronx Society group or a huh. historical group. I'm not sure what it was exactly. If, if you get to talk to him, he'll he'll definitely tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I remember mm -hmm. him telling me that uh, they won a battle of the bands once and to play a bigger show, and it was kind of like uh, bands from like all the different boroughs and stuff. And so they, you know, they they did that. They played the uh, Lowe's Paradise on the Grand Concourse back when wow. it was it was a uh, one big theater. You yeah. know, before they turned it into a, a quad. I believe it's a. Is it still active now? So there was a church in there before, but now I don't think there's anything. Um, I know for a while they yeah. renovated it and they had some events going. And yeah. So I guess that's not anymore. But yeah, I know he got to play there. So it was wow, pretty really cool. cool. And then um, when I was a kid, I remember him playing in a band. He had a band called the, the Cortez Band, which okay. you know, was nice. our last name, um, which was kind of like a, a Latin rock infused band, you know, sort of like Santana-ish, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh that band I used to love. I used to love going down to the basement and watching them rehearse because my uncle was the uh, Latin percussionist. He would play the congas and stuff like that, or timbales. My dad played guitar and sang. And, you know, uh, I, I believe uh, my godfather was the drummer of that band. And, wow. you know, so it was just like a lot of people I grew up around, you know, my dad's friends. And they were really good. So it was it was cool. I, I used to love watching them rehearse in the, in the basement there. Yeah. And, um, uh, I don't remember seeing them live because I was too young to go to shows. Sure. But later on down the line, when he was in another band, uh, Street the Beat, I do remember seeing them live, like performing. They were, um, uh, they started off as kind of like street performers, actually. They were, wow. they'd go downtown, you know, find, find a, an active street, and they'd play Beatles covers mixed in with originals and stuff. And uh, their drummer at the time would play on, like, cardboard boxes and stuff, which kind of gave them notoriety before. Like, there was a kid, I think, in the 80s or, or early 90s that was would play on, like, um, uh, plastic buckets and stuff. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So before that kid got famous, like, their drummer was playing on cardboard boxes uh -huh. in the streets. So, <laughs> you know, that was, like, a little thing that they did. But, again, you know, they, they uh, wound up getting management, and uh, they were playing shows, and, you know, they had a... A nice little run also you know wow i'm sure again you know he could elaborate on things so so yeah you wanted to escape to music <laughs> yeah uh, all that. so yeah, yeah. I, I i grew up around music and you know my my parents weren't together um very long only until about the third grade or so okay yeah but you know regardless you know he was always in our lives you know we always spent time with him sure but one of the earliest things I always remember, my dad had a huge record collection, um, and he, he was a collector. So yeah. records, comic books, and baseball cards. Those wow. are like three staples, you know? Yeah. So um, that's I got my love for like, you know, baseball and cards and stuff from him, music, all that stuff. But I remember as a kid, I used to love looking through his record collection, just sure. looking at the covers and stuff, and you know, 
he always played the Beatles, so I grew up with the Beatles. I love them, you know. A lot of classic stuff, Zeppelin, yeah. um, you know, he had Black Sabbath records. And, you know, like I said, I'd look through the album covers, dig through, and then ask him to play some for me, you know, whatever looked cool. And uh, it was when going through his record collection, I, I came across, like, my first, like, band that I loved, and that was Kiss. Oh, okay. yeah. That, so, that's he, a very common, uh, yeah, my, common answer mm-hmm. with, with Bronx uh, folks and me. Yeah. My dad had all the early Kiss records, and, you know, right away, of course, as soon as I seen them, I was like, oh, these guys, you know, so I had them play them for me, and I fell in love, you know, yeah. right away, that was like, that became my band, you know, so he would always buy all the Kiss records, you know, because he knew I liked them, and, you know, I mean, he bought all kinds of stuff for me, like, he bought the uh, the Flash Gordon soundtrack that Queen oh, okay. was on, you know, because sure, I, sure. I like that, you know, the Star Wars disco album, because <laughs> I'm big into Star Wars, and, you sure. know. But, you know, yeah, music, I was always around music. Like I said, in that building, my uh, my aunt was in there. So when I was a little kid, she would take care of me, and she always had, like, disco music playing. So I grew up with, like, the 70s disco stuff. And, you know, you grow up around it, it's, like, ingrained in you. And, you know, I wound up loving disco. So, you know, like, I'm all over the place with the, the type of stuff that I like to listen to. You sure. Know? So like the disco music and then uh, in the house, it was always all the classic rock and stuff like that that my dad had. Like Yes was another one. Uh-huh. You know, I used to love their album covers were awesome. Um, my mom always had music on in the house and, you know, that was more like whatever we, what was popular at the time or whatever. You sure. know? So there was always some kind of music going, you know. But yeah, so we were, uh, I grew up in that building. Like I said, my parents uh, wound up splitting up around the... Uh, third grade or so because uh, I was going to school in uh, elementary school PS 59 PS 59 okay, okay. yes Bathgate Avenue I believe it yeah. was yeah that's right so I was there till the second grade um, and they wanted to skip me to the fourth grade I see, I see. and my parents didn't want to do that they, yeah. yeah they were just like we don't want him you know with the older kids or whatever so um, I remember from there the principal at the time mentioned there was another school in the Bronx, uh, PS85. It was a little further, but they had a gifted program. I see. It. So we had to go through some channels, you know, through you know, fill out paperwork and stuff to get a waiver. And they sent me over to PS85 for the third grade, and uh, I went into the gifted program there. And that's right around the time where my parents split. So I see. Where's and where's PS85? So PS85. We, we, it was a little bit of a walk from the house. I was on um, going towards Fordham Road. Uh, what is that? Is that Marion or, or the block before Marion? It's like a block off of Webster Avenue. Oh, okay. okay. But, I see, I see. Yeah, a couple of blocks from Fordham Road. I believe one block before Bronin's. I see. So, I see, I see. Yeah, so I went to PS85, and uh, that changed things too because uh, right away I was in the gifted program. It was the early years of like computers in the classroom and all this stuff. So I, you know, I got a, a early introduction to computers when it was like the one big computer, you know, like with the <laughs> floppy disks and stuff. And uh, yeah, it was fun at the time learning basic stuff. But sure. Um, but in in that school in the gifted program, I wound up uh, had a school play, and in the third grade, wound up being in the school play. Gifted class in the fourth grade. Again, the school play. I was in that school play. By the time the fifth grade came around, another school play, I was in that. And always the lead. Wow. wow. You know? So the other thing that 85 had was a performing arts class. So as, as a kid, you know, every time we had these school plays, there'd be other performances at the school, and the performing arts class would put on, like, awesome shows, you know, yeah. like, and uh, the way the performing arts classes were set up, they were totally different. They were like their own entity. They had uh, uh, two grades combined into one class. So you had fifth and sixth together, third and fourth together. And, uh, you know, I would watch these performances and I would love it, you know, because yeah. I'm just into music and the arts and stuff. So after the fifth grade play, I remember the, the teacher for the sixth grade uh, performing arts class uh, came up to me and started, you know, talking to me about, you know, whether or not I'd be interested in possibly joining the performing arts class. Yeah. Right away, I was interested, you know, because I just love it. I love the arts in general, grew up around music and stuff. 
I didn't know how to play any instruments at the time, sure. but you know, I figured I, I was interested. I wanted to go there. So this became a big controversy at the school. <laughs> they didn't want to let a kid from the gifted class go to the arts class because the gifted class was like, you know, uh, was a smarter class or whatever yeah, the case, yeah, was, you sure. know, whatever it was in their mind, you know, that they, they thought it was like a step down going to the performing arts class. Yeah. So it created a big controversy, but still did it anyway. Did it anyway. Yeah. yeah, and I loved it. Uh, the teachers there, um, the, the one teacher in particular, Miss Copstein, I'll never forget her. You know, she just was great. You know, nurtured like creativity, and it was just a totally different atmosphere there. And it was still academic too. I mean, yeah. you know, the kids were still smart, but there was a different focus. There was sure. a focus on you know music and the arts as well. You know, so I gravitated towards that right away. You know, and. Um, same thing. We put on a, a big performance. Again, I was, you know, a uh, lead in that. And I, I know at one one point we did a performance of uh, Walk Like an Egyptian. <laughs> and uh, I think I was, like, playing the, the xylophone. And, oh, no, no, not, it wasn't xylophone. It was uh, bongo drums I was playing. Okay, yeah. wow. Yeah, for part of that performance and stuff. But just a fun time. And um, so from there... Um, Came time for junior high school. Uh, I was supposed to go to junior high school 118, which was pretty close to my house. Sure. That was the school I was zoned for. But at the time, 118 had a, a, a bad uh, reputation, you know, gangs, drugs, whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, like my parents always did, <laughs> they went to the principals, talked to who, you know, who they had to. You know, at this point, it was my mom, you know. Yeah. And, uh, same thing. We had to go to the district and get a waiver for me to go out of my zone or whatever. Oh, I see. And I wound up going to junior high school in Riverdale. Oh, so, what, what number is that? that I uh, so I went to uh, junior high school 141 in the Bronx. Oh, okay, okay. So that was all the way. That's like way up there. Like yeah, like way up in the 50s or something. Or it's, 240s, it's, I forget it's like it in Riverdale on the top of yeah. the hill. Like, uh, uh, what's, what's that? Uh, it's like an observatory or. Is it Rose Hill or something up there? Yeah, what's the name of that? Not too far back. I know what you're talking about, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, yeah, junior high school, 141. Um, I mean... A Wave Hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A Wave Hill, that was it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, very far from my house. So, yeah. as, a, as a kid, I'm taking three buses to school, you know, like... Oh, and uh, And it was at that time, I was, uh, you know, like I said, always into music. Um, being that I traveled so much, I had a little Walkman. I see, so I see. everywhere I went, I had this little cassette Walkman with me, you know, my headphones. And uh, <laughs> I remember, I think it was Columbia House. They used to have this thing where you can get a <laughs> bunch of tapes when you pay for one. So I had my mom, like, buy a tape so I could pick out a bunch of free tapes. Yeah. And the first time I did it, I remember I got, like, all classic stuff. It was like, you know, I, I think I got, like, three or four Kiss, you know, tapes, uh, Zeppelin, you know, uh, Hendrix, like all classic rock stuff. Yeah. And uh, I remember always listening to Zeppelin 4 on that tape deck and Kiss Alive. Kiss Alive was my, uh, uh, I mean, I used to listen to that thing back and forth and, you know, I had the auto reverse on the tape deck, so it would just play that album back and forth, you know, going to and from school. Wow. So, um, yeah, I would always listen to music on the way to school and, and stop off on Fordham Road. Uh, Fordham and Webster waiting for the 12 bus. There was a little, um, a little magazine stand there. Oh, so okay. There was uh, WWF magazine, <laughs> and that was that was my thing. You know, I'd, I'd stop there, get the new WWF magazine, have my magazine and my tape deck, and you know, I'd go into school. You know, whatever it was, an hour and change, two hours. I don't even know. It took yeah. a long time, but you know, that was always my thing. And uh, when did you when did you get into wrestling? Since you mentioned WWF. Oh, wrestling, that's, it's kind of funny. So the earliest memory I have of wrestling is actually with my grandmother. (laughs) Yeah. I remember going downstairs, you know, my grandmother always, big family, we always had family functions, we'd get together at her house, you know, sometimes just for dinners or whatever, you know, Sunday dinner, whatever the case may be. And uh, I remember going down one day to visit her and she had this huge black and white TV and on it was a wrestling match, and it was the first one I remember seeing because she was so into it. And it was uh, Sergeant Slaughter versus Pedro Morales, oh, and she shit. loved Pedro Morales because uh-huh. he was the Puerto Rican wrestler. Sure, so sure. yeah, and uh, 
that you know i remember watching it with her and she was all excited and into it you know and uh, from there like i just remember watching it and stuff you know and and uh yeah i got into it my dad you know wound up taking me to my first match at the garden and stuff you know so yeah wrestling that that was another early passion too absolutely know? absolutely i mean yeah. the, 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 the two go hand yeah hand they hand. they definitely do which yeah. later on comes into play too yeah, <laughs> with sure, some of the sure. friendships i developed um, but and but before we continue with your musical journey, just a couple, yeah. um, you know, childhood related questions. Uh, so why don't you talk a little bit about um, things that you and your friends would do for fun, like around the building or around the neighborhood? So early on as a, as a little kid, I was the oldest of three at the time. So um, again, going to school out of my district, I was always traveling a lot and, yeah. you know, a lot of times I would have my brother and sister with me, so I was kind of always looking after them. So a lot of times I was inside a lot. I, I didn't really spend a lot of times out in the street and stuff like that. On my block, I hung out like early on because I had a lot of family in my building and, and you know, the old families that were there, you know, we knew everybody. Yeah. So as a little kid, we'd hang out on the block, you know playing you know all kinds of like street games that nobody plays anymore <laughs> uh, off the wall off the curb you know uh -huh. manhunt you know all, all these games and stuff but other than that you know as as the, the like as our family started to move out and, and you know other families started moving in and stuff and you know we, we just didn't know as many people the neighborhood wasn't quite the same sure you know my mom kept us in and kept us out of trouble and everything but uh -huh. You know, that's kind of where I, I also got into, like, all the things I, I'm into now, you know, into comics, into movies, into all that stuff, because we were inside, you know. My yep. mom was a big reader, so always books. She was into movies also, so we watched movies together. But, yeah, as far as, like, out in the streets and stuff, that wasn't really, you know, that wasn't something that I, I was, I wasn't like a street kid at the sure. time, you know. Sure. And uh, it wasn't until, like, junior high school and stuff when I was traveling. Then I was all over the place. Yeah. But, again, not so much hanging out in the streets. It was always traveling to do something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as far as uh, uh, things that you remember eating growing up, why don't you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> eating. Um, yeah, well, I mean... Bronx Pizza. You can't beat Bronx Pizza. <laughs> right. No matter what anyone says. <laughs> there was this place on 3rd Avenue in Tremont, man. Huge slices and, I mean, delicious pizza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that what was, was the name of that place? you remember? I, I don't know if it was 3rd Avenue Pizza or, or if that's just what we called it. Yeah, you know? yeah. But, yeah, right on the corner of 3rd Avenue in Tremont. Um, we used to go to a church right around the corner from there. It's not there anymore. But uh, every, every weekend after church, right to the pizza shop uh -huh. and stuff. And, um, yeah, in, in my teenage years, you know, I used to hang around the Bronx a lot. Like, that was my sure. thing. Like, so, exploring, like, we'd go walking all over the place, me and a friend of mine, you know, and just checking out new neighborhoods and stuff. Yeah. So, but, you know, other than that, before that, it was pretty much my neighborhood, which was like uh, the Tremont Avenue, like the, I, I don't know what, that, what that's considered. If it's, it's, I guess, sort of like Central Bronx, because yeah. it's not quite the West Bronx yet, that's and it's right. definitely not the East Bronx. Yeah. But, like, Tremont to, like, Cortona Park. We'd go to Cortona Park a lot. Sure. You know, that was one of our places. Um, you know, my grandmother, you know, and, and my step-grandfather, like, you know, they had a car, so they would take us to, like, different parks all around. We'd go to Pelham Bay Park, you know, Orchard Beach. You know, like, those are all, like, spots that we always went to. Sure. And growing up, going to Orchard Beach was always fun and having big picnics there, you know, yeah. meeting with family there. But... Um, yeah, I don't remember any like particular foods other than the pizza, you know, the, the little cuchifrito places that, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're almost completely gone now. Yeah, I know. You, you really don't see them anymore. Yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's way before chopped cheeses and stuff like that. <laughs> so. What about, like, um, your parents or grandparents? Like, would they cook very much and what oh, kinds of things would they cook? Yeah, so I grew up in a Puerto Rican household. My, my grandmother, forget it, was always cooking. Yeah. Like, she was... I mean, I swear, like, if you went over to her house, like, she was always, you know, at least partially in the kitchen. There was always something cooking, and, you know, it didn't matter, like, anybody, any one of my uncle's friends or anybody could stop by at any given point of the day, and there was always food for them. She always had food, you know, like, it was just one of those things, uh -huh. so. 
and you know, which looking back, you wonder like, how did they do that? You know, like on on limited budgets and everything too. Forget it. I know. But yeah, that was always a thing. You know, yeah. it was always food. So like, I mean, great. You know, arroz uh, con uh, gandules. You know, like uh, uh, my grandmother made um, pasteles, oh, yeah. which that's a yeah. She, her her pasteles were like famous. She used to actually sell them all over the Bronx. Wow. You know, people would give her orders. She you know. On, She'd always have like a, it was like a particular day and I was like the day that was dedicated All to making day. them. Yeah. And then she'd make a ton of them and, you know, pack them up, put them in the freezer, get her orders. And then they'd go around doing their deliveries and stuff. Wow. Uh, the Acacurias, which uh, are my favorite, uh, you know. So yeah, there, There's some good, a couple blocks down. Yeah. They sell out of a pizza shop. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so, I mean, all the, all the great Spanish food, like I remember growing up with that. That's something I miss now. I don't. I don't get as much nowadays. I, I'm, I'm a little further upstate now, and there's not as many like good Spanish restaurants up there. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so going back to your musical development, you left off before we took that little diversion. <laughs> um, you you bought the you got the Columbia deal, um, <laughs> and where did your musical taste evolve after that? So yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I, I was listening to my tapes to and from school every day, you know, uh, to uh, junior high school 141. And then early on, uh, one particular day on the way to school, I'm walking from the bus stop to the school and in the grass, I see a cassette tape. So I'm like, okay, I pick it up. I look at it. It says Metallica, jump in the fire. It was an import tape. So now at that point I, I'd heard the name Metallica. Yeah. Like I've heard of them, but I never listened to them. Like I was, like thrash and stuff. I had no idea, you know. So I, I put this tape into my my cassette, you know, into my. I get chills now. My Walkman, and like it changed my life. Like I heard Metallica, and I was like, oh man, you know, it was uh, the Jump in the Fire import. I forget exactly what was on it, but it was like some songs from Kill 'Em All and stuff. Sure. And oh man, it just it hit me. Like I heard that. It was faster, heavier, you know, than like anything I was listening to. And right away, I was just like fell in love that was like my new band you know wow so i guess someone did someone like drop it or it had, throw to, it out? It had to be because it wasn't in the case it was yeah. literally just the the tape like in the grass somebody must have dropped it or something yeah wow. and and so by chance i found that tape <laughs> and I, you know it became like they became my new favorite band that's like, a, literally that's an amazing story yeah it was pretty cool and uh i remember in, in junior high school like starting to finally like meet other friends that were kind of into like they weren't we weren't metal heads yet you know what i mean sure. but like uh there were kids that were like into rock like uh appetite for destruction had just okay. come out so like yeah. that was pretty heavy for us you yeah. know so we were listening to that you know i had the metallica tape now and so that like, you know opened me up to a bunch of stuff and uh i met this kid he was in my class this kid named justin pierce okay he was skater kid huge into punk yeah. and uh and I remember I had heard, uh, you know, after, after that, because once Metallica, like, it opened me up to other stuff. So right away, Megadeth, like, I just started deep diving into as much stuff as I could find. But I had heard uh, Anarchy in the USA. Okay, sure. And I, I told him about it because I knew that it was a, a Sex Pistols song. Yeah. And, you know, so I let him hear the, the Megadeth version. He let me hear the original version, and we kind of bonded off of that. And then he turned me on to, like, all these punk bands you know, the dead Kennedy, Susie and the Banshees, like all that stuff. And uh, it's funny because years later I find out that kid Justin became an actor. He was he was in the movie Friends uh, as Casper, uh, okay, main wow. character in that. He was in uh, Next Friday and like a bunch of stuff. But wow. Unfortunately, by the time I realized that he was in the acting world, I, I wanted to like look him up. I found out he passed away. But Damn. yeah, that was, that was a bit of a shame. But, you know, it was... He was a cool kid, you know, another friendship. You know, he turned me on to, like, the punk side of things. Uh, I met another kid. His name was uh, Aaron Aaron Kelly. And he wound up, later on down the line, he wound up becoming a singer of a death metal band called Death Room. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, wow. he, I think he just went by the name Kelly at the time. And, wow. uh, yeah, so we reconnected later on down the years. When, uh, you know, when I was in DBH and stuff, I think we played a show together. And I was like, oh, man, you know, so... It was kind of cool, like in junior high school, like there was a little group of us and we'd hang out in this little park, you know, when we had a lunch break or whatever, and we'd talk music and just kind of turn each other on to new bands and stuff. 
and were were all the other kids at the school like from near the school or were there other yeah, kids from? Yeah, I, I was I was generally from like the uh, Broadway area and then I um, uh, uh, what's it called um, Riverdale, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I I'm pretty much the only one that was from out of town there, um, and then. I was only there for two years. I did seventh and eighth grade there in uh, 141. Then uh, high school. I, I forgot exactly what it was. I, I think I had a choice to go to uh, Stuyvesant, but I didn't want to travel that far. I see. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I wound up staying in the Bronx and I went to Columbus, Christopher Columbus High School. I see. I see. I see. And, and did your mom already live? Did your mom live in that part of the? No. Oh, okay. So yeah, again, oh, that was a, another out of out of district school. Uh, uh, again, I would have I would have uh, been zoned for uh, Roosevelt on Roosevelt, Fordham Road. Yep. And again, another school with a pretty crappy reputation at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the other thing was that they had no sports, and I, yeah, and that, that was another thing at, at the time. Like I was kind of looking into that, and um, so I wound up going to Columbus. Okay. Wow. And I remember. My first day of uh, Columbus, like I had finally gotten like my first metal shirt. I wore a Metallica t-shirt to school and uh, I met this kid. He was in my homeroom at the time, uh, Nicholas Ho, Chinese kid. That kid was awesome because he had, I mean, uh, an immense like tape collection yeah. and uh, he would just make like uh, mixtapes for me. Wow. You know, we, we became friends because of the Metallica t-shirt and... Uh, you know, he's like, oh, you like metal? I was like, yeah, of course. But, you know, I didn't have a lot at the time. I had a few tapes. Of sure. And he would just, you know, just make all these different mixtapes for me. Oh, check out this band. Check out this band. And it was really cool. So I, I constantly turned on to new music, you know, through this kid. Wow. So that was great. And um, also in high school, I wound up meeting another guy, uh, Vinny Casucci. Now, Vinny, <laughs> he's a character. You, you might have heard his name from like some of the other bands yeah, he's yeah. been around uh Vinny and I same thing we bonded right away over metal he was a a, a bit of like uh maybe an outcast at the time because uh you know they used to call him satanic Vinny and stuff you know he, he wasn't afraid to wear like all the you know the metal stuff and, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. you know there, there was only a handful of metal heads in the school at the time and uh -huh. you know he was like definitely the most extreme in what he wore and stuff so I see. You know, like some kids were like afraid of him and stuff like that. I met him, you know, we bonded right away and, you know, he's a sweetheart of a guy, you know. <laughs> so, like, you know, we became good friends right away. And, uh, like, Vinny, like, our friendship there, like, again, like expanded my, my whole, you know, metal, you know, world. Because, again, he was a single child, you know, an only child, I mean. And uh, his his parents, you know, they... they <laughs> basically it kind of spoiled him but whatever you know he had a huge tape collection also so yeah, yeah, yeah. i got to listen to a lot of cool music through him and same thing wow. i'd borrow cassettes make copies of you know bands that i like but uh yeah i'd go over to his house we'd listen to music he had a, a full stack in his bedroom wow. which at the time you know he, he could play a little bit but he was like the first you know kid that i was like oh man you know this guy's got guitars and a full stack and stuff and you know we were always hanging out um at the time, Headbangers Ball was like, you know, brand new. Sure. And in my part of the Bronx, we didn't have cable yet. Yeah. So he, you know, they had cable. And, uh, you know, I, we, we became pretty good friends. So, like, I'd go over to his house, like, on the weekends. And, you know, I'd spend the night and we'd watch Headbangers Ball together, you know, just to catch, like, you know, the two or three, like, heavy videos that they had. Everything uh, else was, like, glam rock and stuff at the time. Right. but. You know, we we wait for like a Metallica or a Megadeth or, you know, like whoever at the time, whoever it was. But, you know, like that was like uh, another person who was uh, a, a big like influence as far as like uh, getting me into all kinds of stuff. He opened me up to uh, like black metal, like all the he, he was big into like the Norwegian black metal and all that oh, stuff. Okay, and, okay. you know, told me like the stories of, you know, like all the, you know, like the violence and stuff that went on there and everything, right. you know. Yeah, <laughs> so that's pretty right. cool. So what, just, just for frame of reference, what years were you in high school? So I started in, 
what was it, 90 to 90? Oh, 89 to 93? Yeah, okay, I gra so graduated in 93, yeah. I see, yeah, so black metal just was coming on the scene. Yeah, and, and you know, he, he was into that stuff before. I never even heard of it, you know what yeah. I mean? I, I, even death metal was kind of new at the time. Yeah, sure. So, because, like, during those years, my high school years, like, uh, where I lived, like I said, we didn't get uh, the cable until way later, so I, I didn't have access to, like, Headbangers Wall or anything like that. Uh, where I lived in particular, I didn't get uh, 89.5 that good, which was oh, SOU. Nice. So SOU played a lot of awesome music at the time. Yeah. But where I lived, I just couldn't get it. You know, it, there were certain days I'd get it, you know, in or out, you know, but not, not too well. So it was kind of disappointing. But I remember finding WNYU, which was 89.9, uh, I believe. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. So that I found on my own, and... They had a, a metal show called Metallurgy. Fell in love. They were playing all kinds of stuff. And again, I would just, you know, find all kinds of new bands through that show. Yeah. Then I found Crucial Chaos, which I'm sure, you know, other guys have mentioned. That was a big show also there. And the thing about Crucial Chaos, though, was that they had, like, live in-studio bands. And that's when I started hearing, like, bands from, you know, New York and then from the boroughs that I had no idea. I was like, wow, these guys are from the Bronx too? You know, like... Uh -huh. Do you remember some of the bands that... Yeah, like, so back then it was like a Close Call, uh -huh. Without a Cause, like uh -huh. those bands, you know. And uh, just hearing some of the names and like uh, Rampage from the Bronx, you know, you know, I was like, man, I, I didn't know these bands even existed, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, um, and then later on, you know, once I started actually playing, you know, like Going to Bronin's. Bronin's was uh, where I, I think I actually bought my first base. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, I see. And, and that's, I met like Frank there, who was uh -huh. in Without a Cause at the time. Joe Rampage Joe still Rampage, worked there. Yep. There was another guy in the band too, I forget his name. But, you know, they were all cool guys. So. Loki works there, I don't know if he's was, Yeah, Loki, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, I think he was in Close Call at the time. Yeah. 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 Um, so. Wait, were you, were you in high school when you started playing bass or? No, so. By the time I had high school, my 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 dad had gotten remarried, okay, and he moved out to California. Oh, I see. I see so I see. in the summer, I would actually go out to California and spend like almost the whole summer with him. You know, yeah. like a month and a half, almost two months, whatever it was, and I'd spend the time out there. And uh, you know, it was kind of cool because we were like in the Bay Area, and you know, again, I was a big Metallica fan, so. I'd be out there, and, and my dad had a garage set up with, you know, as a studio, you know, with all his instruments out and stuff, and he'd go to work, and I was just there, and I'd kind of just start messing around with stuff. Wow. And one day, he came back from work, and I remember he had this uh, bass that I loved. It was a, a music band, Stingray Bass. Oh, those are beautiful. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, love yeah. it. So, you know, I had the thing, and I, I told him I want to learn how to play it, so he showed me, you know, a couple of things, and... Uh, whatever it is, you know, I think everybody learns like smoke on the water or something like that, you know, yeah. wh whatever it was that I learned, you know, but, you know, basically showed me a couple of things. And from there, that was it. Like, I just didn't want to stop. And, uh, but I had no instruments at home, when, you know, sure. going back. So I remember that summer, like after I was going back to New York, he called up my aunt. My aunt had a, a step kid at the time. Yeah who she had bought a bass for, but he totally lost interest in it, and it was like in a closet, you know, just gathering dust. And uh, basically he said, you know, whatever, I'll pay you to, to give it to, to Manny. And whatever, they just wound up giving it to me. And <laughs> it was funny, though. It was kind of an undersized bass. It was like this small little white bass, but whatever. I made it work. You know, it was like my first instrument. And uh, Do you remember what, what brand it was? <sighs> I, I don't. I, it wasn't a major yeah, brand at sure. all. And like I said, undersized, some, uh -huh. some beginner bass or whatever. But I do remember with that bass, I was like, I'm starting a band. I have an instrument now, I'm starting a band. Yeah. And, you know, Vinny was the only guy I knew that had, you know, real equipment and instruments and stuff and actually knew how to play some stuff. Yeah. So right away, um, I, I believe it was the end of senior year, we started uh, this band, Degression. I see, I see, so, I see that's when started it yeah nice. so yeah. right right at the end of senior year i believe it was so it was uh vinnie on guitar myself uh, on bass uh we had another friend scott on vocals and he he knew a guy uh, uh what was his name i 
forget the, the, the drummer's name, Jay. Uh, this guy, Jay, who played drums. So it was the four of us originally. Um, I, I believe, like, right after we graduated. You know, we, we used to get together at a, a studio at the time. It was on, uh, right off of Eastchester Road called East Coast Studio. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. think it was Poplar. Poplar Street. Yeah. But, um... Is, is that... Did, did that eventually become, um... Music, music Unlimited? Unlimited? Oh, no. Okay, so it was actually... Ah, it was like a block and a half up from Music ah, Unlimited. Okay, okay, okay. I see. So, yeah, this place existed for a while. Uh-huh. And, uh, there was a guy who ran it named Doc. And that, you know, we, we found out about that place and we started going there to rehearse. Yeah. Uh, very cool studio because it was all mic'd up so you could re- record your rehearsals and wow. stuff. So you basically made demo tapes every time you went yeah. to rehearse, you know? So, yeah, we, we did that for a while. Then we graduated. And after graduation, um, I think we rehearsed like maybe a couple more months. But then the, the one guy, Jay, wound up leaving or, or maybe we got rid of him. I don't remember at the time. Yeah. But we needed a drummer. And that's when I remembered from high school I had a, another acquaintance at the time. We weren't even really friends. Like I didn't know him that well. Yeah. But he was in the... Uh, school band playing drums and I was in the chorus and then I had the lead in the play. I was very involved in high school with yeah, a bunch of sure. stuff. So um, I knew this guy Shane and got his number through a mutual friend, called him up and asked him if he'd be interested in playing drums. So he came in, you know, right away, headed off. He was playing drums for us. And uh, again, I was maybe another couple of months or so. And we actually started, you know, writing songs and developing like a little sound and you know something was starting to come come of it and uh one day shane comes to practice and tells me he he met this other guy who plays guitar also we only had one guitarist at the time and we kind of wanted a second guitarist and he was like i met this guy uh really cool guy his name's tito so tito you know he brings him in one day to rehearsal we meet him another great guy you know we hit it off right away uh, Tito used to play in a band called Above It All, and they were a hardcore band. And uh, I, I never forget hearing that little demo tape that he did with that band. And he had written a song called uh, A Little About Too Much. Uh, no, it wasn't A Little About Too Much. No, I'm sorry. No, it wasn't A Little About Too Much. It was, was it Concrete Jungle? It was the first one. Oh, man, I'm so bad. Oh, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. He, I, he, he might have told me. I'm, I'm going to take a look real quick. You keep talking. Though. Yeah, I, I have to I have to double check, but there was one of the songs that he had that was actually written when he was with Above It All, and we loved it. And uh, right away, like, Shane, Tito, myself, like, we kind of, you know, we, we kind of decided, like, uh, that's, that was the route we wanted to go, or like, the style we wanted to go. Because Degression really didn't have any direction at the time. We were all, like, you know, metalheads. We were all into metal. Yeah. But we were all very new in our writing and, and playing. And so the sound was just kind of developing on its own. It was more like a doomy metal kind of sound. I see. Which, you know, probably comes from being less experienced musicians playing slower and stuff like that. But, sure. but we were writing songs. We had stuff going. But when we heard uh, Tito's song with Above It All... Was it You Know, I Know? That's one of the songs he mentioned to me from an early stage, but that might not be it. Yes, I think it was You Know, yes. So it was You Know, I Know. So yeah, that was it. I do remember now. So yeah, You Know, I Know. That was it. And um, what I loved about it was right away his lyrics. Like, that was always, like, my favorite thing about Tito. I loved Tito's lyrics. Like, he was a great lyricist. It was always, you know, stuff drawn from experiences and like, I I just always really enjoyed, you know, like uh, the way he put together the stories in in his songs. Sure. And, uh, you know, if if you grew up in the Bronx and, you know, you were an inner city kid, you probably related to some of that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. So like to us, it was like, all right, this is about as real as it can get. You know, like we're writing about, you know, stuff that's happening, you know, it was a hardcore sound at the time, you know, sure. like, I guess, you know, like hardcore metal, whatever you want to call it, you know, it was yeah. co- all kind of blurred in those days, That's you right. know? Yeah. But yeah, that was definitely the way we wanted to go. So one day I remember we got together and, um, 
White Castles on Allerton Avenue, which okay. was that was sort of like our meeting spot. Whenever a big decision had to get made, we met at White Castle on Allerton Avenue because it was close to Christopher Columbus. And yeah, stuff. sure. And my friend Vinny lived up the block from there, but we met with the guys and basically wound up telling Vinny and Scott that the other three of us were going to leave and form this new band. And uh, we wound up uh, forming the new band. It was myself, Shane, Tito, and Tito's drummer from above it all, Don, Don Murphy. I see, yes, yes, yes. And uh, so Don was great, man, big Don. <laughs> and where, where, did, where did the other DBH guys live in relation to you? So uh, Shane was all the way down by uh, closer to uh, Columbus High School. He was by uh, uh, Astor Place, I believe it was. No, Astor Place is where Columbus was, but he was like two blocks down oh, from Columbus. Okay, 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 I see, I see. Yeah, he, he was a couple blocks from there, like not too far off of Pelham Parkway. Uh, Tito was on Marion Avenue. Okay, yeah. By, uh, uh, what's, what's the next big uh, intersection after Fordham Road? Uh, there's Kingsbridge, and there's the, the Concord. No, it's a parallel to Fordham. Oh, oh, parallel to Fordham. Yes, like crossing Webster Avenue. Uh, um, oh my goodness, I can't believe I forgot the names of these streets. Oh, it goes by like the botanical. Like yes, botanical, botanical gardens, gardens over there. All. Yeah, and and, and the <coughs> Jolly Tinker Bar. Yes, the exactly. I, I forget what the name so, of it is, but I know. Yeah, Tito yeah. lived like literally a couple of blocks from the Jolly Tinker, right I over there see. on Marion Avenue, and. Don was, uh, I believe, closer to, like, the Grand Concourse. Oh, okay, okay. So you all were a little spread out. Yeah, we, yeah. we were a bit spread out back then. Don and Tito met, uh, met each other in high school. They went to uh, All Hollows together. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and Sheen and I were both Columbus guys. Yeah. So. And, uh, yeah, once, once we formed DBH, uh, like, that was pretty much it, like, you know, we became pretty tight, you know, the four of us. And, um, yeah, Don was, like, you know, totally different. Like, Shane moved to guitar. Yeah. At the time, Tito actually played guitar and sang. And Don was playing drums. I was playing bass. Uh, Tito really didn't want to play guitar. <laughs> so he just wanted to sing and stuff. So Shane was actually a really good guitarist, which, yeah. you know, when I first brought him into Degression, I had no idea, you yeah. know. Turned out he was a great guitarist, so, uh, yeah, once we brought Don in, forget it. Don was a really good drummer. Shane was really good on guitar. I was still a novice at bass, but that was kind of my thing starting out. I always sure. played with better musicians because it made me better. I had, sure. I had to play better, you know. I had to kind of learn from these guys as I was going, you know. So, um, yeah, we started, uh, started writing songs. Um, I had just started uh, my first year of college, John Jay. I see. I, I was see. I was going to John Jay downtown, um, and after my first year, like I don't know, maybe not even my first year, maybe my first semester, whatever it was, I started not going to class and meeting up with Shane, yeah. and you know we'd just be hanging out all day at his house, like just writing songs, working on music, wow. you know. And uh, I remember, you know, uh, writing a couple of songs, like DBH songs, there together, you know. And uh, that was that was like it. That was the new passion, you know. It was all about writing music, and you know we were rehearsing at uh, East Coast Studios. Then finally, Music Unlimited opened up. I see. so that was a new studio. So we were like one of the first ones in there. We were like, oh, let's check this place out. And uh, Music Unlimited, you know, it had a different vibe. You went downstairs, and you know, it had like a, I don't know this grittier, cool kind of vibe. So that kind of became our new home right off the bat. You know, we started nice. rehearsing there. And uh, rehearsing there, we wound up meeting other bands. Sure. And I forget exactly how we got our first show. I think it was because we met these guys, uh, Hell Bent, not Hell Bound, Hell Bent. Yeah. Oh, that's, so, that's a new one. Yeah. yeah so I heard they, yeah, mention them. they were a, a metal band from the Bronx also, but they were like, uh, I think they were more from like the. Uh, like Eastchester Road kind of area. Okay, 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 I see. But we ran into them, and they had more of like a classic metal sound. They covered okay. like a lot of Maiden and stuff like that. Yeah. But they were good. They were really good musicians. The singer was really good. And I, I, I think we met them in the studio there, Music Unlimited. 
and uh, we wound up getting onto a bill. And I believe it was, it might have been through them because I'm pretty sure we used half of their equipment. Because <laughs> at the time, I'm telling you, we started, you know, we started things. We didn't have equipment. We had nothing. Yeah. It was yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like I remember Shane playing through uh, an old Randall head. But in the very beginning, he had like a, a, a car speaker cabinet that he would like hook it up to, you know. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't have a bass rig at the time. I remember using like the bass player's rig and stuff. So, you know, we made do with what we had. It was For about sure. as hardcore as you could get, For you know. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Absolutely. But, but uh, we, we finally, you know, we got onto a show with these guys and it was on uh, at a place called lowdown in mount vernon ah the lowdown okay yeah. do you remember around when it was that first show uh so it was i'm gonna say 94 yeah some sometime in probably early 94 okay okay i see and uh yeah i mean from there then it, we just kind of went full force we played our first show and we would play basically any place that we could kind of find you know and at the time it was a, like i don't know there were there were like a lot of like small places like that's when we found the train depot for instance uh, I see. Yeah, which sure. at, at the time the train depot was literally like a little cafe uh -huh. they didn't have a stage they had you know nothing <laughs> no sound system um but they were booking shows there and uh i remember we had gotten a show there and uh i, I believe it was through scott brick this guy who was promoting shows at the time yeah or, or Either it was through him or we met him there. I know we definitely met him right around that time, early yeah. training depot years. And, uh, like, that was big because uh, Scott wound up being a, a pretty big promoter at the time, you know, for, like, Bronx bands and stuff. Uh -huh. And, uh, I, you know, he, he uh, started booking shows at the depot. He was booking shows all over the place. Uh, uh, Rockland County, you know, yeah. Westchester, Jersey. So once we met Scott, like, that was uh, that was it. Like he kind of took a, a liking to us because you know we were Bronx guys. We were like a hardcore band, but he had had I guess bad experiences in previous years with hardcore bands. You know, like like I guess being tough guys and stuff. Yeah, I, I sure, know at sure. some point you know whatever. I think got into a fight or something. But you know we were always like you know just real down to earth regular guys. You know yeah. never tried to portray ourselves as tough guys or nothing like that. So he kind of like you know took a liking to us right away and he would just book us all over the place. Wow. So, um, real, real quick, just to go back to a, a couple things. Um, now by the time DBH got together and all, had, did you go to any of the like, like Lehman battle of the band? Oh man, I left out all of that, that whole section. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess, I guess you can talk about like your experience, your first experience going to shows in general, and then we'll come back to, Oh yeah. Um, I DBH shows and absolutely all that. yeah 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 so again Vinny was big in in my you know my metal uh, you know history or whatever <laughs> yeah for sure, for sure. Uh, so Vinny was the one that uh, actually took me to the Battle of the Bands his his mom uh, his stepfather actually drove us to the Battle of the Bands in I'm gonna say it was probably like. 90, 91 maybe. Uh, okay, do you remember any of the bands that played that time? So, uh, Requiem. Okay, Requiem. Requiem right. like headlined the show. They weren't part of the battle. They were just kind of like the headliner. Oh, you know? Okay, okay. So okay. it was like the whole battle of the bands uh, before them and then like Requiem played. And like, I just remember that show, like it felt like a real show, you know, like yeah. I, I walked in with Vinny, you know, I don't think I've ever been around so many metalheads at the time. Yeah. And, you know, like all these bands are playing and they're all kids, you know, and I was yep. like, man, this is great, you know. And then Requiem, they were a little bit older. So by the time they came out and they were like, you know, they already had like a little name for themselves. So, you know, yeah. you kind of looked up to these guys, you know, like, oh, wow, you know, th these guys are doing it, you know. So like that was really cool. And I just remember like the energy at those shows and stuff. And like that was a, a big thing. I was like, oh, you know. Like, I want to do this, you know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> so. yeah. Was that your very first show in, in general? So, I'm not, well, I mean, my, my first concert was, like, with my dad, but... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, but, that's right. Yeah, but, but, for like, sure, for sure. But, you know, as like, he, like... He, he took me to uh, Julian Lennon, which was, like, my first real concert I remember oh, going okay, to. Okay, okay. Again, big Beatle fan, John yeah. Lennon's son. So. Sure. And one of the cool stories, he always told me that uh, when I was a baby... My mom and him went to go see Kiss and Aerosmith at the Garden and brought me as a baby. So that, 
technically, that's my first concert. Whoa, so whoa, I, whoa. I, I, you, you beat everyone else before. <laughs> technically, I was always a Kiss fan. But, um, yeah, as far as going to, like, local shows or anything like that, the, the Battle of the Bands was, like, the first kind of local show that I had really been to. Yeah. And in high school, um, listening to uh, Metallurgy, that, that radio show, I used to always win tickets. I was lucky like that. Oh, I'd call up, wow. and I, I remember winning tickets and uh, to, to a bunch of different shows, and I would always take Vinny. Vinny was, like, my go-to. Yeah. So I remember once I won tickets to, uh, to see Death, which I, wow. I fell in love with Death. They, again... I had heard them on Metallurgy, um, pulled the plug. That was the first song I heard by them. And I heard that song. I was like, whoa, you know, like Metallica was already heavy. I heard that. I was like, oh, this is something else, you know? So like death was huge, you know, but I won tickets to see Death, Gorefest, and Sacrifice. Wow. And uh, what was the name of that place? It might have, I don't remember the name of the place, but it was a small place. And uh, Vinny and I went and we were like, right up on the railing front row wow. and that that energy and everything and the pit and, you know just it was just awesome you know like i'll never forget that show because it was a smaller venue you know so I like see. that was like my first like kind of like i guess like club venue that yeah. that was like really packed with you know big bands and stuff and like that was awesome like i remember that um i also remember winning tickets to see anthrax white zombie and quicksand okay at the okay. roseland you yeah. know Vinny and i went to that we went to go see guar at, at uh the limelight that was another good one yeah. but yeah so like i would win these tickets and we'd just go to these shows for free you know and, and were you were you very big at, at that point into going to the pit and, and dancing and all or? so at, at that time it was all new to me i was more into watching the bands so yeah. like i always wanted to be up front because i wanted to watch the bands yeah. but you were in the pit by, yeah. you know, by default. So, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of how that wound up. So I was definitely, you know, in pits as a kid. But sure. it was mostly because I was always trying to focus on the band. So you know, I've always see, been into watching the musicians and, you know, I what see. they do. So that was always a big thing. And um, as far as, as years prior to um, Drift by Hatred, are there other Bronx shows in particular you went to other than the, the Battle of the Bands? Like, did you go to the Chippewa Club or, like, no. any of the other... Um, uh, there's like a church, um, like or it's like Metal Fest or Metal Mania, I think that some people mention things oh, like that. So not before then. Back back then, I really, like I said, I was kind of in the house a lot. Yeah. And uh, so I I didn't get to really go out and experience all that stuff. Not until high school, and I was yeah. kind of going out on my own, you know, with Vinny and you know whatever, you know, like sure going to shows then. But before that, yeah, I didn't really get to go to like a lot of those like like uh, church and club shows. I mean, uh, like whatever party shows that I've heard about, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, later on down the line, you know, uh, there was another church in the Bronx. Uh, they had the Bronx underground and stuff. Yeah, and that's right. That's, that's right. But that's, like that's way, yeah, that's, that's right. way later, you know, um, we'll get to that. <laughs> and, and as far as, um, uh, you know, going back to driven by hatred now, um, would you all perform like in backyards or house parties? I know some bands in the Bronx did that. Yeah. Um, so back then we didn't really know anyone, so yeah. we weren't playing any kind of parties or, or okay, backyard okay, shows. Sure. Not in the very beginning, at least. Anyway. I see. I see. In the very beginning, we were we were playing a pretty decent amount of like little clubs and cafes, basically wherever we could get into. And it wasn't until we started meeting like some of the other bands, like uh, one of the one of the big like pivotal shows like we had been playing for a while and uh uh another studio had opened up uh in bronin as a matter of fact and that was chongo studios okay. so now chongo was i mean that was in our backyard you yeah. know like so i was like oh we got to check this place out so we wound up uh going to chongo studios rehearsing there a few times and same thing they had it set up so that you could record your rehearsals so somewhere there's recordings of us there wow but it was after rehearsing there a few times, the uh, the guys that ran Chongo, they were like, yeah, we're, we're uh, putting on a show at this place called the Blue Frog. Ah, the Blue Frog. And okay, that, sure. that was like a, that, that's like a, a landmark show, like in my eyes anyway. Cause, yeah. Like that show was the show that we wound up meeting, like the Go to Mentis guys, uh-huh. uh, you know, uh, that, it was, uh, who was it? It was us, Go to Mentis, Close Call, Without a Cause, and maybe one other band. I'm not sure. But, okay. but that was the very end. Uh, that was, I 
I think it might have been close uh, without a cause's last show because they had at the time no bass player. Uh-huh. And I don't remember if it was Armando. I think it was though. I think Armando was singing with them, but still under the close call uh, name. They were about to change it to Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was yeah. right around that era. And I mean, uh, without, oh, a without a cause. I'm cause. sorry. Yeah, yeah. And and right around this, it, it might have been one of close calls last shows also. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, right yeah, so, time, so. so that was like a big show, and I remember like the sound check for that show was awesome. Like you know, by then, you know, we, we had a few shows under our belts. We had been playing around and stuff, but we were playing like on like all kinds of mixed bills with like you know rock bands, you know, like bands that were more classic metal, all, yeah. all kinds of stuff. This show was like heavy bands, yeah, and uh, I'll never forget the sound check. Because, uh, you know, we set up, we do our thing, then the goat guys are setting up. Over walks this tiny little kid. Short guy walks over, gets behind the drum kit. I'm like, look at this kid. How old is he, 12? You know, like, oh, what the hell, you know? That's right, because he was young. Oh, That's man. Tough. Yeah. So he gets behind the kit, and it's Frankie. Yeah. Frankie gets back there, starts setting up. And then his feet start going, and... Right away, we all stopped in our heads. It's like our jaws dropped. We were like, oh, wow. Listen to that kid's feet go. His double bass and just like the energy he had. We were like, wow, this kid's a beast. So like we were looking forward to hearing them. And uh, they played, you know, we played, we did our thing. They played and they were awesome. They were, you know, Martin was great. Martin was a great front man. You know, tons of energy and stuff. Uh, Frankie blew us away, you know, because he was so young at the time. And, you know, little dude and great double bass and stuff. And, uh, you know, Barry was there. Uh, I forget they had the other guitarists, I think Rendon at the time or yeah, whatever. that's right, that's right. But, I mean, they they, they had they played well. They, they put on a hell of a show. And right away, like, we met each other at that show, became good friends instantly, you know. Uh, and, like, from there on, like, we started playing shows with them and stuff. And, and it wasn't that long after um, I got a job downtown i was working right across from tower records in, in manhattan uh at, at a little like new age shop called uh, star magic okay <laughs> and uh the manager there and i became pretty good friends and she lived in throg's neck oh so I see, I see. her her mom had the house in throg's neck and i think they were having issues with the house or something like that or the neighbors whatever the case may be <laughs> but I remember uh, she had told her mom that, oh, you know, I met this guy. He's got a band, blah, blah, blah. They need a place to rehearse or whatever. So she mentioned it to her mom, and her mom was like, hell yeah. Have them come over here. They can play. You know, they don't even have to, you know, pay or whatever. We wound up giving her, like, money for the, the electric and stuff. But, yeah, sure. I mean, it was nothing in comparison to, like, studio time because we'd yeah. be there all day. And she was awesome. She let us just hang out. And, you know, so it was great. Uh, we, that became, like, the new DBH headquarters. And, wow. Um, you know, right around that time, I think that's when, uh, Don, Don was like the first to leave. Don had gotten a job as a, a paramedic. Oh, I see, I see. And, uh, you know, he was the first one with like, I shouldn't say the first one with a real job because Tito was always working. We were all, all working. Yeah, but, sure. But, uh, yeah, Don just, he went into the paramedic field and, and he wound up leaving. So, uh, uh, Frankie was, uh, you know, friends with us, and we wound up kind of bringing Frankie. He was doing... Uh, duty, huh? Actually, I think it was triple duty in the very beginning. Oh, really? Because what was he with? In the very beginning, I believe he was still playing with The Wasted. Oh, and, I see. And he was playing with Go to Mentis wow. and then joined DBH. And then he left The Wasted, like, shortly after he joined DBH because yeah. it was just too much with the three. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so he, he joined DBH and... Uh, we, we were rehearsing at that house, and, and uh, at that time, like, that's when the train depot kind of converted from being a little cafe to becoming a pretty, like, they expanded, and they built a real stage there, brought in a sound system, put some money into the place, yeah. and started putting on bigger shows. So, Frankie definitely, I mean, we were good with Don. Don was a really good drummer, but Frankie kind of leveled us up a bit, you know? Yeah, sure. And, uh, I, you know, the, the writing just kind of you know, just exploded with him. You know, we started writing newer songs, heavier stuff. Uh, we were definitely starting to get influenced by some of the other bands we were playing with because now we were actually playing with heavier bands and stuff. Sure. And, you know, so our, our writing style, I think, changed a little bit. 
And then I believe right around that time, Shane also started pulling double duty with Goat because they, you know, they always kind of had things with guitarists kind of in and out. So yeah. Shane started uh, playing with both. So like DBH and, and Goat were kind of like intertwined for a little bit there. Uh, and they were they were rehearsing at the house for a little bit also. Oh, wow. And okay. I mean, that house, I mean, it, it helped us all out. We all tightened up, you know, like DBH became a lot better. Goat, you know, got better, like. Where, where, was, where was that house? Yeah, I mean, not the exact address, of, you so, know, but like the, because it's like a landmark. Yeah. Bronx <laughs> music. That's <laughs> true. Uh, it was over in, in Throg's Neck, right, right off of like uh, Waterbury Avenue. Oh, so one of the little yeah, side okay. streets like off of Waterbury. But uh, yeah, so that was, that was pretty cool like that time. And, and we were getting bigger shows now too. Um, my friend Scott, who was booking, you know, like, all kinds of shows. He wound up putting us on with, uh, uh, we, we played shows with like, uh, nuclear assault. Oh, wow. We played, okay, okay. uh, with the corporation who was uh, death angel, you know, when uh-huh. they changed their name, uh, you know, which like for me, like right away, I was like, this was great. Cause you know, as a kid, like I had all these bands, like my, my room was covered in posters of all the bands that I loved and stuff. And you know, like I was already starting to play with some of these bands that were up on my walls and you know, I was like, Oh, this is cool. And then, you know, Scott had a lot of big hardcore ties. So, like, you know, we got on to shows with, like, Murphy's Law and okay. Crown of Thorns yeah. and, like, you know, uh, 25 to Life. All the big hardcore bands at the time, you know. Sure. Uh, Fahrenheit, you know, they were blowing up and doing their thing, you know. It was, it was really cool. So, we were playing a lot of shows. And uh, uh, we, right around that time, we started meeting, like, uh, like, some of the other Bronx bands, like, aside from Goat. Yeah. And I forget the year. It's probably 94, 95. But there was a show that got put on right off of Westchester Avenue uh, near Castle Hill in a backyard. It was uh-huh. a big backyard show. I, I know this one. I've it, heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, so they wound up doing maybe, I think, a couple there. Yeah, but yeah, the, the yeah. first one was, I think, the best one. But, yeah, it was this big backyard, like, party show kind of thing. And... Uh, you know, we played there, you know, DBH. And at, at that point, like, you know, other bands were kind of, like, giving us a little respect as just having been around, you know, sure. for a little bit longer than some of them. But, you know, Goat played, and uh, I believe Blackout played. Um, maybe Burn Down, this other band. Yeah, Burn Down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and then uh, I never forget that show because that was Irate's first show, or at least first that I remember seeing I think, them. I think, I think I, it was their first show. I think it was show, their yeah. first show because I remember they had no bass player at the time. Yeah. And it was another one of those moments where, like, they got up there, they start sound checking, and when they started playing, I was like, whoa, these guys are good, you know? <laughs> I, think, I think the flyer, there was a typo, or, you know, there was like a mistake, yes. right? Oh, well, what the? Oh. I, I, I think it was Iraq or something. Yeah, like that. it was, was something, because I remember, yeah. yeah, whatever the name was, we were all like, who, who are these guys, you know? Like, so I do remember that. But yeah. Uh, they were impressive, like that first show. I remember because they had yeah. they had no bass player, but they still sounded awesome. Both guitars were great. Uh, 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 you know, Phil was great. Uh, everybody, the whole band, you know, yeah. like yeah, they they impressed right off the bat, you know, and, and like it was just a great great show. And it, it was kind of like funny because I think it went all the way to the end, and then right after the last band played, like it kind of got shut down. But it, you know, we had gotten the whole show in, so it kind of worked wow. out, you know. But that was that was a great show, and through that show, we kind of started hanging out with these other bands, started playing more shows with them, and like all the Bronx bands started kind of you know coming together and forming friendships and stuff. And uh, not too long after, I think uh, it's when they started the BDC. The BDC. Yeah, which that was pretty cool. I remember right around that time. It was another band, Rights Reserved. You know, we were playing with them a lot also. It was like a whole little crew of bands, you know. That's right. And uh, I had actually wound up joining Rights, Rights Reserved also. Oh, okay. You were in Rights Reserved for... Yeah, oh, for a little okay. while because uh, I was playing with DBH. I really liked Rights Reserved because they had a totally different style. They were like a little yeah. more groovy, a little... Like they had like uh, influences like... Like more like uh, Candiria helmet. Uh, I see. Like they just a little a little different, and you know, I, they were cool guys also. You know, and yeah. So I started hanging out with Leon at the time, who was a guitarist, and uh, right around the time we were hanging out, um, uh, 
what's his name? Um, oh my goodness, the the singer. He was playing bass at the time. Sang for Godamentis also. Uh, oh, oh um, Malik. Malik. Oh, sorry. Malik, yes. Malik. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Malik. Drawing blank. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so Malik was playing bass and singing in Rights Reserve, and then it became one of those situations also where he just became just the singer, and they brought me in as a bass player. So I played with them, and I was pulling double duty with DBH and Rights Reserve at the time. And you know, I, I enjoyed doing it because they were different styles of bands, and I just at that point I was just you know I loved playing, you know, yeah. so like especially if it was a different style of you know music that wasn't exactly the same because why be in another band that sounds the same you know yeah for sure so you know it, it was cool it was like a whole different style different group of guys you know and i was doing both for a while and uh we wound up playing like you know there was like a lot of bdc shows we'd hook up shows with all the different bdc bands you know some out in in westchester some out in queens uh the uh whatchamacallit became Castle Heights. Yeah, Castle, Castle Heights, Heights became yeah. like a like a second home for like a lot of the Bronx bands, you know. Sure. So we played there. Uh, like one of the highlights with Rights Reserve was that was uh, the first band I played CBs with. Oh wow! So, yeah, so wow. I, that was that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so I, I played with them for a little bit, and DBH was doing the same. You know, we we were playing out also. Then. Uh, I forget the year exactly, but uh, DBH wound up splitting up, I'm going to say, probably around 97-ish. I see, I see. Some, something like that. I see. And, and y'all, y'all, y'all played already at the Blackthorn. And... Yes. Yeah, so the, the Blackthorn, yeah, we were doing the Blackthorn. Like, that was one that of, like, the... just started. Well... That, I, I, I forget what year that... <laughs> see, I'm, I'm bad with the years, yeah, I know. No, no. But again, the Blackthorn, like I was there for its an inception, basically. Yeah, sure. Because uh, again, uh, in DBH, we played Queens a lot. Yeah. Uh, one of the clubs we played was Raw out in Queens, which Nicky Camp used to book. Yeah. Uh, he was promoter there. And uh, he hooked up with my friend Scott, and Nicky was moving over to the Blackthorn in the Bronx and putting some money into there. They you know, expanded the stage, put a sound system in. And he brought in Scott to help him book the place. Yeah. So right away, uh, I was kind of in on the ground floor, like playing shows there, but I also worked the door there oh, for a lot of okay, shows. Okay, okay. Yeah. So like whenever it was one of Scott's shows and I wasn't playing, yeah. I'd be hanging out, I'd work the door, you know, and, and just basically hang out. So yeah, it was like, a you know, another one of our like second homes. And then it wasn't far from Tito's house. So, you know, Tito would hang out there all the time, too. So when we weren't playing, that was like a hangout spot for us. And did, did both Rights Reserve and DBH play? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, because uh, when, when, uh, when the Black Thorn was around, like, we were already doing BDC shows and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, I'm pretty sure there's footage of, like, a couple of BDC shows over there. There is, yeah, yeah. there is. Um, I don't have a lot of footage, unfortunately. I think I think um, Barry has a lot of, of Black or he, he definitely has a a few Blackthorn shows that I've, I've watched. Yeah, but, I saw one on, um, on YouTube that he posted. It was and, pretty good. And, and Ch- Chucky might have. Uh, Chucky has a ton of stuff. Yeah, he has yeah. a ton of stuff. Yeah. Um, but before before we continue on with, you know, DBH breaking up and everything after DBH, you want to just say a little bit about the song Concrete Jungle, oh. since we're here in the neighborhood? <laughs> yeah, Concrete Jungle. So Concrete Jungle, uh, again, was one of our earliest songs. Um one of one of Tito's uh, stories about <laughs> the neighborhood here. Matter of fact, uh, we're right by the, the uh, what is it, Oval Reservoir? Yeah, Williamsburg or, Oval Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be a reservoir. Used to, yeah. used to be, yeah. We we always knew it as the reservoir. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. But hanging out there, so uh, yeah, he wrote Concrete Jungle, the lyrics so, uh, about experiences hanging out there, and yeah. I always loved his lyrics. I never forget them. As darkness descends upon a concrete jungle, off we go, packing heavy, because we know each confrontation could be the end. Ten o'clock, the journey begins. You know, better beware, because it's a fact. When you're in the Bronx, boy, you best be strapped. You know, like wow. that, that was you know, one of his verses. There, it was just you know, it was it was all truth. Nothing yeah. that he said in his lyrics was you know made up or exaggerated. Yeah. You know, I mean, 
You know, That's right. Uh, whether, you know, I don't know if we should be talking about guns and stuff like that, but, you know, it, it was a reality. <laughs> yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so. Um, yeah. And did Rights Reserved or DBH, did you all record, I mean, obviously you were recording your practices at the studios and all, but did you record um, demos or anything like that? Yes. So yeah. with DBH, uh, once we moved to Music Unlimited Studios, yeah. Uh, there was a, an engineer there, uh, his name was Jay, yeah. and uh, he was the first engineer they had working there. We actually wound up recording a demo with him, and that was our first demo, uh, pre-digital era. We, it was reel-to-reel, -reel, you know, so wow. like old school. And uh, yeah, we recorded, I believe, a four-song demo there, okay. and we had Concrete Jungle, You Know I Know, A Little About Too Much, and uh, what was the other one? Till the end, yeah. Till the end, I should know that one. I, I had a big part in writing that song. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we recorded that demo there. Uh, I always loved the album cover or tape cover because it was a cassette tape at the time. Uh, Tito took a picture in his room of just a bunch of stuff on the floor, literally like money, sneakers, weights, like I think his gun at the time. Yeah. You know, like just a bunch. Sure. Of, it was just like our stuff. You know, like and it, it was just a cool little. Uh, cover i thought it was a great cover and uh we just printed out you know tons of copies of that and and you know just put it out or wherever we could gave it to whoever we made little stickers put them up all over the place wow. you know tito and shane both drove so like whenever we were driving you know it's wherever you know like uh drive throughs or whatever we'd slap a sticker there wow. gas station slap a sticker there and Apparently, it kind of worked because, you know, years later, like, people would be like, oh, yeah, you know, I've heard of DBH. You didn't really hear of us. You've just seen our sticker. But it's okay. <laughs> you know. do, do any of y'all still have that demo, copies of that demo? Uh, so I have it digitally. Shane, oh. Shane, Shane has it, all the music. I know, oh, okay, I know okay, he definitely okay. has all the music because he sent me copies of the early demo. I see. And... Uh, DBH also was on a compilation that was put out by this kid from Queens, uh, New Found Hope. Oh, I've, yeah, I've heard of that. I've yeah, so we were on the first the first New Found Hope compilation, which was like all kinds of like hardcore bands and stuff from all over. Yeah. And we had two songs on there. Then afterwards, we got approached by a kid from Jersey who was, uh, he was creating a label called Deaf to Reason. D, D, uh, yeah, DTR, Deaf to Reason. And we did a split with uh, another band. I don't remember the name of the other band. That one kills me because we don't really have copies of that. I, I know, well, I think there's, Shane, again, might have copies of the songs digitally. I see. But, but no is. hard copies, yeah. Because wow. that one was printed on CD. So was the Newfound oh, okay. Hope. Yeah, the Newfound Hope uh, compilation was also CD pressed also. Newfound Hope, I believe I still have somewhere. Okay, who, who is the split with? That I don't remember. Okay, it was okay, a Jersey okay. band a at the Jersey time. Band. I see, yeah, I see, I see. it wasn't anybody we knew. But. I see, I see. So, all right. So you you all you all did a few recordings. Yeah, yeah. So we were we we definitely had a few recordings out. You know, um, every time we did like when we did the comp, they gave us you know a bunch of CDs that yeah. we could sell on our own. I think we wound up giving away most of them anyway. You know, sure, sure, yeah. Sure, you just sure. want to get the music out there and That's stuff. Right. So. That's right. Um, what about with Rights Reserved? Did you record anything with them? Yes, so Rights Reserved, uh, same thing. We also recorded a demo. Um, that one I don't remember where we recorded, though. But I was on a on a demo with them because I remember that, that was what we were giving out at the time and, you know, getting shows through and stuff. But, yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to um, record something with Alex from... Rice Reserve, so nice. I'll ask him. Yeah, he, he, he'd probably yeah. remember. If, uh, I don't, have you gotten in touch with Leon at all? Or not? not yet. Not uh, yet. He, no. he would definitely know. I don't, I don't think anyone has put me in touch with him. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. If, if you know a way to get in touch ah, That's been years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, But, yeah, uh, Rice Reserve, I was doing for a while. Um, after Rights Reserved, I had, I had left Rights Reserved. Will from Blackout wound up joining Rights Reserved. I see. Because I Blackout see. had pretty much dissipated by then. And, I uh, see. And out of Rights Reserved, two other bands wound up forming, which was uh, Will and Leon. They formed Side, this band called Side. Oh, yes, yes. And that's uh, C Y D E 
Yeah, C, right? yes. Uh, I think. Either CY or CI, I forget, CI, but yeah, definitely yeah, with yeah. a C. With the C right? Yeah, so uh, they form a side, and then Manny and Alex form the Moria with, uh, with Malik. I see. So, yeah, D, uh, so Rights Reserved kind of had those bands come out of that. Okay. So, yeah, right around... So after uh, DBH was done, Rights Reserved, I, I left, and you know they did their thing for a little while, then became those bands. And then that's right around the time where I joined Four in the Chamber. I see, I see. And how long were you with Four in the Chamber? So Four in the Chamber I wasn't with very long. Um, originally, you know, I, I met the guys just through the scene and shows and stuff. Uh, Dave and I had... had had uh, bonded over our mutual friend Scott because he went to high school with Scott. Oh, so okay, okay. Scott Brick. Yeah, um, sure. And uh, as we got to know each other, then we really bonded over wrestling and stuff like that. So, you know, we'd go out to see ECW shows in Queens at the Elks Lodge yep. and stuff like yep. that. And uh, he introduced me to Kevin Gill at the time who was running SFT Records. And wow. he was also a big wrestling fan. And, you know, uh, Pete the Meat from No Redeeming, Social wow. Value at the time. So like, you know, I'd hang out with those guys, go to shows, and uh, as Dave and I became friends, I think they needed a second guitarist, and he kind of was like, oh, why don't you, you know, try out, join the band, and I was a bass player at the time, I didn't know how to play guitar, so yeah. I was like kind of weary of it, but we were pretty good friends, and, you know, I wasn't really with anybody at the time, so I was like, you know what, I'll give it a shot, so back to Bronin's, <laughs> <Back to Bronin's. laughs> got a guitar, and... Uh, Wound up uh, meeting up with those guys. Frank Fro showed me their songs. And, um, yeah, basically I wound up uh, joining Four in the Chamber. And that was right before the Unstable Foundation uh, recording. I see, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, so when I joined the band, they had already had the studio time booked for Unstable Foundation. Yeah. So I had done a few practices with them, rehearsals, and... Uh, then, you know, it was off to Pennsylvania for the recording. But at the time, honestly, I wasn't up to par for recording, you know, because sure. I was just learning their songs and stuff. So Frank did all the recording duties on his own. They, they put me on the album because I was, you know, as far as the pictures and stuff, because I was in the band. Sure, sure. But all I did on that album was backing vocals, you know. I see, that I, was see, it. I see. But that was all Frank. And uh, But we put that out, and then we started playing shows off of that. And that was a fun time because... Uh, you know, they had a nice little following going. They were starting to create a buzz themselves. And yeah. we were playing pretty big shows out in Long Island and, you know, a bunch of different places. Uh, one of the standout shows was uh, the Wetlands playing there uh -huh. with with uh, Fahrenheit, uh, No Redeeming. I think the Six and Violence might have been on that show too. But that was like a, a fun show. I remember playing with them there. And, uh, yeah, so I had my stint with uh, Four in the Chamber. And then... My parting ways, uh, parting of ways with them, unfortunately, happened kind of by accident. But <laughs> it's a funny story, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, if, if you want to tell it, yeah, go ahead. No, it, it was nothing like so bad. But uh, uh, by this point, uh, like I said, DBH had split up, but Tito and I still hung out a lot. Yeah, and uh, we had made friends with like a bunch of other bands. Like I said, DBH used to play a lot of mixed bill shows. Sure. So by then we had. Uh, come in contact with a bunch of like more like rock bands and stuff that were like from the Throgs Neck area, um, Morris Park area, sure. stuff like that. So uh, we met these guys. They used to be in a band called Third Rail. Mm. It was a rock band. Um, and you know, we'd hang out with them, go to their rehearsals. Then Third Rail eventually like split up and the guys from that band were forming a new band. And we would hang out there, drink beers, watch them play because they were all great musicians. Yeah. You know, They were a little bit older than us. Really good musicians, totally different style. Like Tito always loved like just like, you know, rock and like chick rock I I call it, you know, like <laughs> where the girls were, like that's uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. that's that's where he was, you know, and that's what he liked. <laughs> so you know, we we'd hang out at, at their studio watching them play and, and stuff. And um I remember uh they wound up kicking out their guitarist. They they had formed a band called Spin World Freak. Uh their Guitarist was with them for a while, and then, for whatever reason, they parted ways with him. And uh, the other, you know, they had two guitarists. The other guitarist, this, this guy Chris Huck, him and I were pretty good friends. And 
one day Chris was like, oh, why don't you bring your guitar to the studio and just jam, you know, one day. And that's all it was supposed to be, just hanging out and jamming. Yeah. So I went, I hung out, they played their songs. I kind of knew them by ear already because I was always hanging out with them. Sure. So I kind of jammed along with them. And it was, my style was very different from their previous guitarist. Even though he was a great guitarist. Yeah. I was, you know, just into the heavier stuff. I'm, I was a rhythm guy, you know, sure. so I brought some heavy rhythms to their stuff and they, they liked it, you know, so it was a fun jam. They liked it. <laughs> and then I think a day or two later, their drummer was in a bar on Tremont Avenue <laughs> having some drinks and came across Frank from Four in the Chamber. <laughs> so they're in the bar together and uh, uh, the drummer... Tells Frank, oh, you know, they, they, I guess they hadn't seen each other while, in a while, yeah. and they started catching up. And he's like, oh, we just, uh, you know, we have this band, blah, blah, blah. We just uh, brought this guy in, Manny, you know, to join the band. <laughs> Meanwhile, I wasn't in the band. You know, I literally jammed with them once, hanging out, you yeah. know. And, like, Frank heard this, and he's like, Manny, you know, and, and asked and realized it was the same Manny, their Manny. So uh, next floor in the chamber rehearsal, forget it. Like I, I could see right away, like I was like something's different. Everybody's got you know the straight faces, and you know they were like, uh, you know, basically I was cheating on them, you know, like in a relationship, you know. And I was like, no, you know, I didn't join this other band behind your back, you know. But whatever, they they had like a no tolerance policy, which you know I I, I understood and whatever. So I wound up parting ways with them. So I was kind of without a band. So I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna jam with these guys now. You know? so, <laughs> So, you know, it was a little unfortunate because I really did enjoy playing with Foreign Chamber and Absolutely. stuff. And at the time that that happened, like, I feel like I was just really starting to, like, catch my stride as a guitarist, as a rhythm guitarist and sure. stuff. So, you know, it was it was a little sad that it worked out that way. But, you know, they kept on doing their thing. You know, they went through other guitarists and, you know, they, they you know, had their own success and that was cool. Yeah. So uh, I went on playing with these guys, Spin World Freak for a little bit, you know, different style of music and, you know, it was something different. So I played a few shows with them, but, you know, after a while I was like, I need the heavy music, you know, like I sure. needed, I needed to be back in something. And it was tough because not since DBH, you know, like I helped form DBH. So like, you know, it's different when you're joining bands, you know, than when you form a group from the beginning, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, Spin World Freak, again, it was it was fun, but it wasn't fulfilling that heavy, you know, music side that I wanted to do. So uh, I had gotten in touch with the Goat Guys. Okay. The Goat Guys at the time, I think things were, I forget, either things were going a little slower for them or some, whatever the case may be. I don't really remember. But it was after Malik was gone, Barry had just moved on to uh, vocals. Uh-huh. And I I wound up joining to play bass. I see. And uh, yeah, we played a few shows together. Uh, I believe we started the recording before Milton passed. Yeah. And then that's kind of what put a halt to that. So that was going, and then yeah, the the whole incident with Milton, you know, that 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 was brutal. That like that ruined us all, you know, like that. I put everybody like it stopped everybody's kind of you know creative flow for a while. You know it was it was sad. Milton was a sweetheart of a guy again. You know like you know, that's that's one of the saddest things. You know he was a father. You know just so many things. But yeah, he was taken from us. And uh, were, were you? All, I for, I for, Barry and, and Ramon talked about it. But were you all in the airport when you heard? Or I, I forget where you all were when you no, heard. Um, he was in the airport, I forget. Yeah, he might have been. Um, yeah, when I caught word of it, it was from one of the other guys. So. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, and it, I mean, it was devastating. It really was. And, you know, yeah, just horrible. Like, again, great guy, great family, you know. like yeah. You know, you never want to see anybody go, but then, especially when it's such a good person, you know, I, it, it was tough. It was definitely tough losing him, you know, losing him that way, especially. I remember, you know, his, his funeral mass and everything. Just that was a, uh, you know, was a tough day for all of us. And yeah. so that that pretty much stopped Go to Mentis in his tracks right away. You know, we didn't do anything for quite some time. Um, and I forget what I I did in that little time. Yeah. But uh, 
Oh, matter of fact, yeah. I think that was around the time. So Goat wasn't doing anything. I had nothing going again. And I found uh, another group that was looking for a bass player. And it was uh, this, this group, Niche. Oh, okay, okay, so okay. So Niche was uh, more of a, a rock band or a, like maybe post-hardcore band, whatever okay. you want to call it. You know? Something like that, But yeah. then another, you know, Bronx group also. And uh, I had met those guys and, and started playing with them. Uh, we played a bunch of shows, you know, played Penn State University, okay. played, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, this previous club out in uh, Harlem. It was like a, we called it the Vampire Club. No, I don't think anyone's mentioned oh, that. Oh, really? All Not right. that I remember, yeah. So there was a place in Harlem that used to throw these like, uh, like gothic kind mm-hmm. of vampire shows and, I mean, everybody would be dressed, it was like, like a scene out of, uh, um, oh, like uh, Blade or something, you know, like it, it was ridiculous. But I remember playing that place with Niche and, you know, wow. it was a fun place to play because the aesthetics were amazing, you know, like, I you know, it was pretty wild, but yeah, that, that place had like a lot of heavy bands coming through there and playing there also. I don't remember the name, but it was in Harlem, like a really big place, like above huh. a bunch of stores, you know. I see, I might, see. Might have been on like Second Avenue or something okay. like that. Okay, okay, I see, I see. But... Uh, yeah, so I, I was playing in Niche for a while, and uh, I forget how long, but again, like uh, somewhere along the line, I had gotten back in touch with Barry. Time had passed, and yeah. kind of was like, you know, I guess pushing Barry to, you know, to try to bring Go to Mentis back because I wanted to play with them and, you know, like wanted to finish the album and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, right around that time, they met Greg, they brought Greg in. I believe we went in, started finishing the album, and I was playing with Goat for a little while while we were doing that. And then uh, right around that time, I met uh, the guys from Overhand Right, uh-huh. which was another Bronx band at the time. Um, so, yeah, the we were finishing up the Goat album. Overhand Right started uh, going through member changes also. They had gotten rid of their drummer, and uh, they brought in Adam, who who was actually uh, Frankie's replacement in The Wasted. Ah, I see, I see, <laughs> Yeah, I see, so yeah. it's kind of funny how it all, you know, everybody kind of is wrong with really? each other. Yeah, yeah, it really <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like an incestuous relationship <laughs> with all the bands, you know. But, uh, yeah, so Adam, uh, originally from The Wasted, he, he was already out of the waist by then. Yeah. He was playing in like a ska band with his girlfriend at the time. Okay. But uh, excellent drummer. I mean, yeah. total like professional drummer. And uh, they had wound up bringing him in at the same time that they recruited me. I was playing with Goat. We had played some shows together with OHR, the, the original OHR, which was overhand right. But um, we played shows together, wound up meeting uh, the guitarist in that band, this guy Joey. I already knew the singer, this guy Chris, from various other bands just in the scene. Never played with him, but, yeah. you know, we had been friends in the studio and stuff. And uh, right away, you know, I hit it off with the guys. We became pretty good friends, and we played a couple of shows on the same bill with Goat and, and Overhand Right. And uh, so, yeah, when they brought in Adam, they recruited me to come in as a second guitarist. So... For a little while, I played, again, Double Duty. I was doing GOAT and the early OHR. We changed the name to Only Hell Remains uh-huh. when, when I joined the band. As soon as I joined, like, because we had the new drummer, the other guitarist, so we were like, it's kind of a new, new band, band, but we yeah. wanted to keep the same initials. Sure. So uh, Bobby, the bass player, came up with Only Hell Remains, and that's how we became that. Um, and, yeah, I was pulling Double Duty for a little while with that. And what was, what was the sound of OHR like? Before you came in, and did it shift at all after? Yeah, you came in? so they were they were always heavy, but their old drummer wasn't quite as good, and they just weren't as tight, and uh, their sound yeah, suffered because of it. You I know? see. So I see. The uh, when Adam came in and basically revamped the songs that they already had, it they almost became new songs. You yeah, know, sure. so but. You know, uh, we were kind of like a little bit of everything, you know, definitely hardcore influence, 
thrash influence, some death influence. So uh-huh. kind of hard to say exactly what we sure. were. I just say a metal band, you know. Sure. But um, yeah, when when Adam and I joined OHR, uh, things started happening very quickly for OHR, um, which right away put me in a kind of a bad spot with Goat because sure. Goat was you know just starting to kind of get things back together also we were starting to play shows again the album was almost done uh things were happening for them so uh joey is actually related joey from ohr is actually related to charlie benante from anthrax Uh so we were presented with the opportunity at that time it just so happened to be that anthrax was doing their reunion tour with the uh with the among the living lineup Uh uh-huh and uh You know, even though we were brand new at the time as a band, we were given the opportunity to open uh, their first two shows at the House of Blues in Chicago with them. Wow. So, you know, we couldn't say no, you know. So so right away it was like, you know, practicing as much as we could, you know. Our songs were still pretty early, you know, like early on, you know, like, not underdeveloped, but not as developed as we wound up becoming down the line. Sure. It was a very early, you know, form of the band, but we had this amazing opportunity. So, you know, we had to take advantage of it and we, you know, we went out there, we, we played the shows out there and they actually went really well. It was an awesome time. But right around that time, right before Chicago, I believe, I, it was, I was being pulled, you know, like away from goat a little too much, you know, like, with the rehearsals and everything. So yeah. I wound up having to part ways with them. And that's when they brought Louie in. I and see, uh, I see. the album had just basically was done. Um, but Louie came in and he recorded his tribute to Milton. Uh-huh. And uh, so then they wound up releasing the album with him on it. So that's why I like, you know, they were awesome. They put me in the credits and stuff. So yeah. still gave me credit for being on the album, which was cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they wound up doing their thing. And then from there on, like, it was, you know, I was in OHR. And sure. see, OHR, like, it kind of gave me that feeling like DBH because, like, it basically was a new band when Adam and I joined, yeah. you know, so we we kind of had, like, that camaraderie, like, we were a brand new band and everything, and, you know, and, and right away with that kind of opportunity, I mean, you know, we were doing big things right away, so that was pretty awesome, you know, like, we went, I think we played a, a handful of shows, like, locally in the Bronx, and then right away it was out to Chicago, so. Wow. That was pretty cool. That's really cool. Yeah, very very cool experience. And and even that, I mean, the the first night we were there, uh, we're we're basically in the House of Blues. You know, they're setting up for sound check and everything, and it's just a lot of waiting around. So we're just kind of hanging around doing nothing, waiting. And all of a sudden, the guys from Lamb of God walk in. We're like, oh wow, it's awesome, you know. So, you know, we were all like, oh, it's cool, Lamb of God. And uh, Randy from Lamb of God, you know he comes up to us and he's like, Hey, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. You know, starts talking it up with us and stuff. Really cool guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after a few minutes, he's like, do you guys have some time or whatever? So, you know, we, we checked and they were like, yeah, you guys got, you know, a couple hours. And we're like, all right. So he tells us, he's like, uh, you know, when we first played the house of blues here, we played with fear factory. And he goes, uh, the, the guys from fear factory took us to this little dive bar down the, down the road he was like, I want to take you guys over now. So, wow. we, you know, we took a walk down, you know, down the street, you know, to this little dive bar and just had beers with Randy. And we we're just, you know, talking stories and stuff, you know, like road stories. And, you know, it was pretty cool. That's, that's and, really cool. And then, uh, yeah, he came back, you know, we did our sound check, uh, hung out backstage with us. And uh, right before we go on, he's like, do you guys mind if I introduce you guys, you know, before you go on? And we were like do we mind of course you know <laughs> so he goes out there and you know before the uh the show starts and the house of blues has a big curtain so he goes out in front of the curtain and he's like he tells the crowd oh you know i want you guys to give it up for my boys from the bronx only hell remains and as soon as he did that it was like an instant endorsement so like the crowd right away you know like took us in you know so, so like we start playing and we we got a great reaction from the crowd it was really cool yeah and uh you know, that night, I mean, what a special night that was, you know, like after playing, uh, I remember being backstage and, and hanging out because the backstage area was like on the second level and there was like a whole row of like, uh, booths that overlooked like the, the, the floor area and the stage and everything. 
So they were like little private booths and stuff. So I come out of our little, you know, dressing room that we had. And standing in front of me is Keanu Reeves. I was like, whoa, you know. So like my singer and I, you know, we look at each other like, oh, shit, Keanu Reeves. You know? So Keanu sees us. He comes up to us, to my singer and I, and he shakes our hands. And he's like, oh, I just wanted to tell you guys you're really good, blah, blah, blah. And we were like, you know, in shock. Wow. We're like, yeah, he was so cool, so down to earth. And uh, afterwards, he invited us into his booth. And, you know, he had like a whole spread there. And we were having Heineken's and just hanging out with him, drinking. And then uh, Anthrax, like, goes on. Yeah. And as soon as Anthrax goes on, like, my singer, myself, and Keanu were, like, on the edge of his balcony. And, like, you know, they start playing. And, like, we're all headbanging together. The crowd, you know, rips into a big pit and everything. He gets all hyped up and stuff. And he's like, I got to go in there. I got to go in there. He leaves the booth, leaves us in his booth. He leaves the booth, goes down. We see him from above come out into the crowd, works his way through the back of the crowd, through the floor, into the pit. And we're watching him in the pit, like just moshing <laughs> with all these kids. Crazy. And none of these kids had a clue that Keanu Reeves was in the pit with them, you know, because they're so insane. focused on the music. Yeah, it was so cool. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, we're, we're up in his booth and we're watching him in the pit with all these kids going crazy for Anthrax. It was, it was a lot of fun, you know. Wow. But the, that whole experience, him being so cool and down to earth and, you know, the guys in Anthrax, obviously, you know, took great care of us, too. So that was that was an awesome experience, you know, playing the House of Blues there. Um, we came back to New York from there. Uh, we caught one other show with them when they came over to the East Coast at the Starland Ballroom. Okay, okay, okay. And we opened up for them there also. But from there, you know, we had a little bit of momentum. You know, people had heard we were playing these shows and stuff. So we were getting more and more shows and, and uh, starting to play all over. Adam at the time was also booking the uh, church in Throg's Neck. It just started, I guess. Right? Yeah. So they were doing that and... Uh, like a whole new Bronx scene was like developing with all these kids over there. So yeah. that was pretty cool. So we, we wound up playing there a lot. You know, it was like a new home base for us. And sure. it was kind of cool, you know, like a whole new generations, of, uh, new generation of kids were coming through and all these other new bands, you know, but yeah. So OHR was doing that. And then, um, uh, I remember not too long after that, we were like, all right, now what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, like, you know, we were playing shows, things were going pretty good for us. Uh, but we wanted to do more, you know? Sure. So I remember we would get together at Joey's basement and, you know, we'd have our drinks and discuss plans and how to, you know, take over the world basically. Of course. <laughs> so at the time, uh, my space was out and, um, we had just recorded, uh, I guess, uh, an, self-released album or, or demo, whatever you want to call it, yeah. you know, it's called uh, Beyond the Depths. And uh, we were like, you know, what do we want to do now? And, you know, me, like, I always, you know, I always thought it was so cool that like Four in the Chamber went out to Europe, Irate went out to Europe, uh -huh. you know, like all these guys went out there, you know, and I'm like, I've always wanted to go there. I was like, you know, that should be a goal. So we got on it and uh, we started sending out our, our CDs, you know, to different people and stuff. And uh, there was this guy in England, this promoter, uh, Weem, he went by the name of, he had contacted us. And yeah. he was like, I love your CD. You know, he was like, it's great. He goes, uh, would you be willing to send me, you know, a few copies of your CD so I can, you know, distribute them around over here? And we were like, yeah, you know, what the hell? What's the worst? You know, sure. we we send out some CDs, maybe it goes nowhere, but you know, whatever, maybe something comes of it. So we send them a bunch of CDs and uh, a few weeks later, this guy contacts us back and he's like, oh, thank you for the CDs. Uh, I've been putting them out in all the clubs over here and, and people love it. And he was like, would you guys be interested in uh, coming out here, you know, for a tour? Yeah. And we were like, you know, right away, like. This was exactly what we wanted. So, but you know, we were like, what are the details though? How is this you know, sure. going to work out? So, um, it, it actually worked out really good. He, uh, he, he apparently out there, like in England, like they, they have all these clubs that are almost like dance clubs. They're huge clubs. 
that when you walk in, it feels like a dance club, uh-huh. you know, big open floor, the lights and everything, but they're spinning metal, you know, wow. like, and the kids are like, they're dancing, but to metal, yeah. it's such a different like world uh-huh. out there. But, you know, there was a bunch of places like that, plus these like other pubs and places that he was just giving our CDs out to and, you know, got enough of a buzz and uh, he wound up booking a bunch of shows for us out there. Wow. So he hooked us up with a, an English band called Massacre on Broadway. Okay. And uh, he booked a tour with them so that we could use their back line. And nice. we traveled with our instruments and stuff. Sure. And uh, basically, he booked all the venues, got us guaranteed money for all the venues, booked uh, our, our uh, hotel stays and stuff like that, which, you know, a lot of times it was like little motels or bed and breakfasts or whatever, but whatever. Sure. We didn't care, you know. I think one night... We, he even slept in the van one night, whatever. Yeah, it was like, yeah. who cares? We're in England, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Wow. But, yeah, it, it wound up really cool. He, he booked a pretty cool little tour, uh, literally spanning, I mean, from Wales down at the bottom, like all throughout southern England, you know, all through wow. England, up, up until Scotland, you know? Okay. like So we, we, we went the whole distance. And uh, once we had the tour booked, then... Uh, Joey, I guess, had let his uncle know, you know, like, oh, look, you know, we, we wound up booking a tour. We're going out to England and stuff. And, you know, they were, like, kind of shocked that we did it on our own. And they were, like, pretty proud of us. So he tells them, he's like, well, it just so happens we're going to be in England the same time that you guys are going to be out there. So they wound up putting us on two shows. We opened up for Anthrax in Scotland and in England. Uh, yeah, we, we did Glasgow, Scotland. With uh, Beyond Fear and Anthrax, okay. and and also at uh, Sheffield, England, with same thing with Beyond Fear and Anthrax. Also, uh, Beyond Fear was um, Ripper Owens's band. Oh, he replaced uh, nice. Rob Halford and Judas Priest. Sure. So that was his band with like guys from uh, Ohio, where he was from, nice. and they were cool. They were a metal band, really cool guys. You know, like we wound up hanging out with them, but it was it was cool. It was almost like a reward for like booking our own little tour out there. So we did our, our own tour throughout England, and then the last two shows were Glasgow and then that, that uh, the last English show. Wow. So, yeah, hell of an experience again, you know? Wow. Did, did you all uh, make it anywhere else in Europe when you all were over there? It was just no, it just un- UK, un- right? unfortunately, we never got to really do Europe. We only did the yeah. UK. Yeah, yeah. we did uh, Scotland, England, and Wales. I see. So, yeah, uh, Europe is still, you know, that's still a, a goal to sure. get out there. You sure. Know? Um, but yeah, we, we wound up doing that, which it was still a great experience. You know, we wound up having a great time out there, played a couple of big shows and then all our local shows that we did were great shows too. I mean, uh, we have them up on YouTube actually. Uh, there was a place called the crown in, um, Middlesbrough, England, that place. Oh man, so much fun. You know, that was a great show out there. A couple of smaller bars that we played out there. Like there was this one place we played. Didn't even have a stage. We played in like a back room of like some bar and stuff. But these kids loved us. And, you know, like we basically played surrounded in a circle of kids. And Amazing. just, you know, we, they danced hard. We played hard. We were like bouncing off the kids as we were playing. It, it was just awesome. So much fun, you know. Wow. And, and just like the crowds out there, the acceptance, you know, like, yeah. you know, so many times like, you know, we'd go to like scene shows or whatever and, you know, There'd be people that were like standoffish. They didn't want to dance for your band if they weren't friends of your band. You know, like all kinds of stuff. Out there, it didn't matter. You know, like the fact that we were from the U.S. and like New York guys, they loved it. You know, they were just open, you know, and welcomed us with open arms, super friendly. You know, it was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, great experience out there. So what what happened when you all got back from the U.K.? Where did OHR go after that? So we got back from the U.K., and we were, again, you know, had pretty good momentum going. We were booking shows all over the place. Like, you know, uh, we were going to, to Maryland, to uh, 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 Maine, I mean, uh, up and down the East Coast. I mean, I all over, you know, like wherever we could, really. Sure, sure, sure. Whatever. We wound up having some issues. We wound up splitting up with them. Uh, we got another singer in the band. And... That always slows things down, you know, once you change members, you know, especially a singer, you know, that's, yeah, that's it, right. it's a big identity, you know, piece to your band. So, um, you know, things changed a bit and uh, we started, you know, 
it took a little while for us to kind of get things going again, but right away, you know, things started going well with him, this guy Brandon that we had, and uh, it picked up right again, you know, right where we left off, um, started playing shows again, and uh, we wound up getting a gig at uh, The Chance in Poughkeepsie, I it's upstate see. New York, and uh, The Chance, you know, another great venue, a lot of national acts went through there, like we, we opened, you know, like we played with uh, Kitty there. <laughs> wow. uh, we, uh, who else? I don't know. We played with a bunch of bands there. I'm so bad. I forget all the bands. Full blown chaos. Like uh-huh. all, all kinds of hardcore bands, of course. Um, but they had a battle of the bands there, and I think that was 2005. Okay. So it was like a two day battle of the bands. We went. We performed, and we wound up winning the battle of the bands. Uh-huh. And the you know the prize for that was to open up for Slayer. So, oh my god! Yeah, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So we wound up actually opening up for Slayer and Unearth at the Mid Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie. Unreal! Wow. Yeah. So I mean, you know, talk about again, you know, playing with your idols and stuff like yeah. that was huge, you know, and a little intimidating at first because everything I had ever heard was that Slayer crowds are notorious for beating up on opening bands and stuff like that. So, you know, we were like, oh, we have to be good, you know? Yep. And, uh, you know, we went into the show, and <laughs> the funniest thing, we start off, things things were great, you know? And I think it was early on, I'm going to say maybe second song or so. Okay. The power went out in the whole venue. Oh, shit. Yeah, wow. like lost, I mean, except the emergency lights, you know, like lost all the sound and everything for like a couple of minutes. And it was like, are you yeah. kidding me? I'm, you know, like we get this huge show, we're on stage and the power goes out on us. But, you know, we, we kind of like, uh, our, our drummer, Adam kind of, you know, just like kind of played, you know, some kept the beat going and, you know, like our singer started talking to the crowd and, you know, luckily the technical difficulties didn't last that long. They got the power back on. And when the power came back on and we hit that first open chord, the crowd erupted because they were so amped up, you know, to have the show yeah, back sure, again. Sure. So right away, boom, they were in our pockets and we played an awesome show and the crowd, you know, they went nuts, you know, so wow. yeah, it actually wound up working to our benefit, you know, it was really cool. <laughs> and, now, had, had you, had you yourself been to a Slayer show before? No, uh, I had actually wow. never even seen Slayer live. Wow. No, no, that wow. was the first wow. time I got to see them live was playing with them. Wow. That's yeah. Unreal. Wow. Yeah. So that was, that was awesome. That was a great experience. Wow. So you all are definitely on an upward trajectory yeah. at this point. Yeah, we were doing very well. Um, then some label interest started coming in. You know, At that point, uh, we wound up hooking up with Charlie Benante to do a, a demo to be shopped to like major labels. Okay, yeah. And uh, so we flew out to Chicago. No. We drove out to Chicago. <laughs> we never flew anywhere other than England. We drove out to Chicago. And um, we, we wound up actually going to his house. He had a studio in his house. And he brought in uh, this engineer who worked on Mudvayne's album. Oh, I see, I see. And uh, he, he came in and he started recording some, basically a demo with us. But in that recording process, the... They weren't happy with our singer's sound or whatever. Huh. And uh, so from there, like, uh, you know, we started, you know, questioning ourselves. And then, you know, for better or worse, we wound up making a decision to change singers. And, I see. you know, again, that's when things started to change. And I think that started to kill momentum a bit, you know. I see, I see. And, uh, you know, we wound up playing more shows. We, we had another singer for a little bit. wasn't quite the same. Uh, we brought the other singer back at some point. And, uh, I forget. We were, we were, you know, we were, we were doing our thing, playing more shows again, like Connecticut and stuff like that. But then Adam, uh, at some point decided he didn't want to play anymore or not with us anyway. (laughs) And, uh, I, I think the, uh, the touring and, and playing out was just becoming a bit much for, uh, it was, you know, there's a different lifestyle, you know, like hanging out and partying and, you know, playing and doing all that stuff. And, you know, I think he just kind of wanted to get away from that. Yeah. And, 
you know, he was with uh, his fiance at the time. I think they were getting ready to get married and stuff. So he wound up leaving the band. I see. And, you know, we, we went through a couple of other drummers from there, but Adam was such a great drummer that I don't think we ever fully recovered from that, to be ah, honest. I see, I see. Yeah, so we played a couple of other big shows with uh, this one drummer, uh, 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 Box. He, he was another like local drummer that played, but uh, he played with us, and we played a couple of shows with him, and, you know, then by then it kind of fizzled out you know like sure yeah it wasn't wasn't quite the same we weren't quite as good you know without the previous drummer at that point you know we were back and forth with the singers and then you know everybody kind of started getting married at the same time and <laughs> so the band wound up pretty much breaking up you know oh, everybody got married had kids and you know that's kind of the way that went you know for a little while yeah and yeah once once OHR wound up splitting up, you know, myself included, I wound up having my daughter, you know. Sure. So at that point, uh, once my daughter was on the way, uh, I was like, you know, I was really looking forward to being a dad. You know? Yeah. So I just, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a break from music. You know, I want to just focus on being a dad, especially, you know, while she's an infant and everything. And uh, you know, I just kind of stopped playing in, in bands for a little while. Still, you know, was writing music, still playing. Sure. But uh, at that point, um, yeah, basically had stopped for a couple of years. I see. And then uh, right around when she was two, I'm going to say, so that, man, that was later, 2016 or so. Okay. I wound up joining, uh, well, or... or I forget if I would help form the band or oh, whatever. Anyway, this band Divine Infamy, which Divine was, Infamy. yes, okay. which was with uh, my friend Vinny from high school again. Because uh-huh. Vinny had been in a bunch of other bands at, uh, at that point. He had started this band. Yeah, he, he started Divine Infamy. And uh, had another friend of ours from high school, this kid, uh, John Colonna, who's an excellent keyboardist. Yeah. And uh, this guy, Brendan, on drums. And they wound up bringing in this girl... <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, pardon me. Sure, sure. No. This girl, Shauna, <clears throat> who uh, blew me away vocally. Like, she came in to, like, audition for the band. Thin, skinny girl, but, man, some voice on her. She had such a big, strong, powerful voice. Wow. And, uh, you know, it was her voice was kind of in the vein of, like, those black metal bands and stuff. And, you know, Vinny was very much influenced by that. So. Sure. The band was kind of like in the vein of like a, a black metal, you know, not quite Norwegian style, but you know, like some a- ambient death metal kind of black metal band, you know. I see, I see. Um, you know, I even painted my face up for for oh. yeah. <laughs> it, it was so different, you know. Like yeah. again, like I've always enjoyed like all the different genres. So like I've always you know like enjoyed just playing. Period. Sure, but. You know, of, of course, if I'm going to be in a band, I want it to be something different. So Absolutely. that was a whole other genre that I really hadn't been in. So I had fun with it, you know. So wow. I even, you know, we, we used like aliases. I had a different name. I went by the name Von Struvius, you know, and painted my face. You know, was, of course, paint and everything. Yeah, it was, fun. Wow. it was fun. I mean, so unoriginal, though. Like, yeah. I, I literally stole like somebody, I think it was like Euronymous's corpse thing, which, God forbid, I played a real black metal show. Everybody would have killed me. But, um,. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever. It was fun, man. You know, we played a bunch of shows uh, as Divine Infamy until uh, one day I'm <laughs> driving into work and uh, I get a phone call from a coworker, and he's like, did your singer get arrested? And uh, I'm like, I'm thinking in my head, like, I'm thinking he's talking about my previous singer, this kid Chris from OHR, who, yeah. you know. Would have made a little more sense, you know, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> but I was like, no, I don't think so. You know, I didn't hear anything about him getting arrested. And he was like, no, not him, not not Chris. He goes, uh, that girl in your band that you're with now. And I was like, what are you talking about, you know? So I get into work, and uh, he, he pulls up the news, because at the time we had a TV. And, <laughs> and sure, you know, sure shit. On, on the TV screen, on the news, there's a story about this girl who's been going into boutiques in, in the village, I believe it was, or, you know, in Manhattan, 
and was robbing them at gunpoint. Oh, God. So I watched the video, and I'm like, oh, my God, that is her. You know? <laughs> it turns out, yeah, she, you know, she, she had a day job, and apparently on her lunch breaks or whatever the case may be, she was going out and doing this stuff, Getting you know. Watched. Yeah. And and the crazy thing was that, you know, she'd have band rehearsal with us like later on those evenings, you know, so I, and we had no idea, you know, like yeah. you would never guess. Like, you know, she seemed like such a sweetheart, you know, like was always wow. really nice and sweet like I you know, who knew she was packing, you know, in her bag she had a gun, you know. <laughs> but whatever. But uh, yeah, she she wound up uh getting locked up for that, you know, did jail time for it. Yeah. So that killed the vine in for me. <laughs> Cause you know, like part of the, the thing was having the female singer and stuff. Sure. Uh, you know, she was definitely like a big part of the sound, but also the image and everything. And Absolutely. Uh, I don't think anybody really had the desire to, to further that band without her. Yeah. So that kind of fizzled out also. And, uh, yeah, basically, I, I jammed with a couple of people over the years, you know, uh, a couple of projects that never really made it out of the studio. Yeah. And, and now until recently, like most recently now, I've uh, just started playing again, writing new music with uh, some of the guys from OHR and trying to get Vinny on board to do another little side project too. Because, wow. you know, he's always been in my, my musical life kind of, so. Yeah. You know. Um, so do you have a name for the new project that you're no i wish i did you know to, to okay. give you guys uh the you know the the music with the only hell remains guys yeah uh, we might just release it as only hell remains because okay, it's all the original members minus adam right now i so see, I see, I, so i'd love sense. to get adam on board but yep. i don't think so he's he's uh gotten into uh promoting actually he's a pretty big time promoter from what i understand yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, booking shows at, at uh, big venues, like uh, I believe he does Irving Plaza and a couple other big venues in the city. You know? Yeah. So I don't think uh, it's in the cards to get him back, but we'll, we'll see. We're working on uh, trying to get somebody in there. Sure. Now, looking back on all of the different bands you played in and all the different shows you played in with those bands, you've, you've mentioned you know a number of shows already. Um, are there other shows that kind of stand out that you haven't had the opportunity to mention with any of the bands? Uh, like some, in general, like I always loved like the, the BDC era. Like yeah. that era was so much fun because like at that point, you know, uh, there was, there was a, a, a good amount of Bronx bands and like yeah. we had all kind of like really had a, a good camaraderie going, you know, we were putting on shows. It was almost like a family, you know? And, yeah. That was one thing I I always loved too, like about like uh, you know like some of the households that you know we'd get together and like like Tito's household was one of those you know they were one of those families like they everybody came in the first BDC meeting was at Tito's house matter of fact you know like his his parents they they invited everybody in so you know like it, it was cool you know like the camaraderie you know like and and the fact that you know at the time like there was a big queen scene and stuff like that and we were kind of like establishing ourselves is like you know look there's a bunch of bands here from the bronx and you know, you know we're making some noise too you know right. so it, it was pretty cool but like that whole era was just so much fun you know like so not a particular show but there were a bunch of bdc shows that i just you know low down bdc show that was great comes to mind there was a few at the blackthorn that uh -huh. were great you know the party in in the uh the backyard over there which kind of was like the beginning of, of what eventually became the BDC. Like, yeah. like that whole era, that was just so much fun, you know? A lot of a lot of camaraderie just between all the bands, you know? That's what I really liked about it. Absolutely. Um, were you involved at all in, I think it was, a, I know it was the first, but the first and only zine that BDC put out? Have you no, seen that No, that, that, so I believe that was Ramon probably. That, Ramon that, was definitely in. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, because he, he was always with... Uh, you know, the artistic stuff and yeah. doing flyers and stuff like that. So I'm sure, uh, I'm sure he had a, uh, a big part to do, you know, with that. Uh, as far as like the BDC thing, I wasn't involved in like getting it together as much. I was a part of it because I was in one of like the founding bands. Sure. But that was more like, uh, like Tito, Shane. I, I think yeah. they were like more like the, the diplomats of the band, you know, like, yeah, sure, sure, sure. um, me a lot of times like even with shows and stuff like 
I worked a lot, unfortunately. Yeah. And and I was always I was living on my own uh, since I was eighteen. Yeah. So you know I had to pay rent and stuff uh-huh. like that. So I didn't always get to go to as many of the shows that I wanted to. You know. Sure. So I was going to shows obviously that I played. I tried to make some friends bands and stuff like that, but. Yeah. A lot of times I was either working or rehearsing with my own band, you know, yeah, so. Absolutely. Um, and you've mentioned, you know, obviously the Blackthorn, the Blue Frog, um, the Train Depot. I mean, of course, there's the the Lehman High School Battle of the Band shows. Yeah. Are there other venues around? Oh, and of course, you know, Bronx Underground. Any other venues around the Bronx that you remember playing? Uh, the Venues in the Bronx, not so much. Uh, there was some that I heard of, but they were a little bit before my time. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if the Rising Sun was in the Bronx or Yonkers. Yonkers but that yeah, was Yonkers, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a but little yeah, bit. Metallica, yeah, early that, 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 that was a yeah. little bit before me, so like yeah. I missed those. There was a place in Throg's Neck that uh, guys told me about, but again. I, I've heard of that. Before. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember. <laughs> playing like a, a house show. Some of the house shows were some of the craziest shows, man. There was a uh, one house show near Fordham University. Okay. And uh, when I was in OHR that we played that, I mean, it was just madness. We, we played in this little room, again, packed. I mean, bodies on top of bodies, kids dancing, knocking over equipment. <laughs> Somebody got thrown through a wall. I mean, <laughs> chaos, but so much fun, you know? <laughs> Another another like apartment show that was like somewhere closer to the concourse, but I don't remember exactly. You know, like, so there were a few of those. Those were always fun. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so, and, uh, oh, oh yeah, I'm go, sorry. Go, go, and, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. and and just you know, one other place. It wasn't a Bronx venue, but uh, the Lowdown. The Lowdown oh, was yeah. uh, another like staple kind of place, and I played there so many times. And it was my first place, so that's always like near and dear to me too. Absolutely. Uh, matter of fact, there was <laughs> one show that DBH played there. I remember we got put on a bill with uh, Clutch. I don't know if you know Clutch. 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 They're, so. they're like a like a heavy jam band almost, but I you know, see. but but they're a signed act, you know. Yeah, sure. And uh, they were on tour with somebody, and my friend Scott had booked them to play the Lowdown on one of their off dates on the tour. Okay, okay. <laughs> but apparently, it wasn't promoted too well. Ah, so like we okay. we. You know, the guys in DBH, we enjoyed, like, that Clutch album. So we were like, oh, you know, we got put on the bill, and we were, like, excited to play with them. But <laughs> we we go to the show, and there's nobody there. I oh, mean, it was, like, God. us, like, the one or two other bands that played in Clutch, and no one else, you know? So, like, they're there. You know, they have a tour bus right outside the place yeah. and everything, and they come in, and the place is empty. And you could see, like, the disappointment, but, like, they were getting paid, and uh-huh. they were, you know professional class acts about it all they didn't like you know alienate themselves and hang out in the tour bus they came into the bar they hung out they had drinks and stuff they watched all the bands play and then when it was their time to play they went up on stage and they they played basically that album that was out at the time and then they just jammed they just jammed for a long time like for us it was like a a personal show for us like to hang out (laughs) and watch them you know so like that was pretty cool that is cool but that uh that venue was was great like i remember uh, Murphy's Law playing there at, uh-huh. at the Lowdown, and I mean, tearing the place up, you know, like having an awesome show there. Fahrenheit, you know, um, uh, certain shows that, you know, just stand out going to. I wasn't on the bill, but I just loved, you know, like certain shows like uh, watching Hellbound with uh, one of my favorite shows seeing them was when they played uh, CBGBs. We went to go see them with Crisis and Candiria. Uh-huh. And man, Every band, Hellbound was awesome that night, Crisis was awesome, and Candiria was awesome. Blew me away. And, like, you know, that was just a great show to see, you know, like, one that, you know, stands out and stuff. And, you know, they were friends of ours at that time, so, like, it was, you know, it was great, like, seeing your friends, you know, playing big shows like that. And, you know, CB's always, you know, that was, like, a place you wanted to play because it was so famous. Absolutely. That was always, you know, a good time. But, yeah, that was a fun show. So... You know, some of the some of the shows I remember we weren't even on, but you know, there was just great times, you know, yeah. just supporting friends of ours and stuff, you know. Sure. Now there's a question that's always fun to ask at the end and everyone has very different answers. Um, and I'll ask it in a second, but before I do that, 
are there other things you'd like to add before we kind of get to the final question? Anything else you'd like to add that we haven't touched on yet? No, uh, I don't know. So much. I mean, I just, you know, like me personally, I just like to, you know, reflect on this because, like, I just appreciate all the friendships through the years, you know, like seeing all the other bands, you know, being fortunate enough to, to play or jam with a lot of these, you know, other bands and stuff. And, you know, I've always had a big sense of pride, you know, being born and raised in the Bronx, coming from the Bronx, you know, and still having ties there, I still work here, you know. And uh -huh. so, like, you know, there's always been a sense of pride of, like, all these bands that kind of came out of, you know, especially, like, my area. Like, you know, we grew up not having money, you know. Like, we were all poor kids, you know what I mean? Yep. And we all found each other. We all found metal. We were all playing shows with, like, barely any equipment, sharing equipment, you know, uh -huh. like, all kinds of stuff. And But it was all for the love of the music, you know. Everybody yep. loved the music, whether, you know, regardless of the genre, you know, like, of, of you know, or, or the subgenre, I should say, of, yeah, like, sure. metal or whatever. But, you know, everybody was always about the music, and we all bonded over that. And, you know, I've made so many friends, like, through the years, you know through the music scene and stuff. I'm super grateful for all of that. And, you know, I'm grateful for you, you know, you guys doing this, you know, this whole, uh, uh, exhibit or, 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 you know, allowing us to tell our story and everything. So, Hey, it's, 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 it's a cool. pleasure. Yeah. It's yeah. been a pleasure so far. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you just mentioned the Bronx scene and this is, you know, a good segue to the final question. Um, do you think there's like a Bronx, you know, metal sound or Bronx hardcore sound, Bronx heavy sound? And, you know, the answer could be no. If you, th if you think the answer is yes, um, how would you describe that sound? Or maybe it's not a sound, but an attitude. What do you think? Yeah, uh, an attitude, definitely. That's, yeah, yeah that's, I mean, uh, there's kind of no mistaking like all of the Bronx bands, you know. But I think one thing that... Uh, especially like all, all the heavier bands, you know, from my era, especially, uh, we were all, you know, we were all kind of like around for the birth of hip hop and all that stuff. So I, I think you definitely, you'll always see like heavy grooves and stuff and like, you know, they, they might be played out differently, different styles, but there's always like some kind of heavy groove like mixed in. It's definitely a hip hop influence. You know, I think that, it kind of comes through a lot of like the bands and, and not even, not even always in the music, sometimes sure. just in the attitude or style, you know, like style of dress. Like, sure. you know, I remember early on in DBH, that was one of the funny things, you know, like we'd wear super baggy, you know, jeans with the Timberland boots and oversized Carhartt hoodies and stuff, <laughs> you know, like, you know, we didn't look like metal guys at all, uh -huh. you know? So that was always a thing, but that was all the Bronx bands, you That's know what right. I mean? Like, you know, that was definitely a thing throughout. So definitely like the grooves, the, the, uh, the, the hip hop influence. Uh, and, and I don't know. I mean, you know, watching one of the other interviews, one of the other guys said, it. I don't remember who, but it's so true. Like in the Bronx, like I think it's very different from the other boroughs where like Brooklyn, even Queens to an extent, like, their neighborhoods are very segregated. Yeah. And in the Bronx, like, the Bronx was like a true melting pot. Like, everybody, you know, there were all kinds of nationalities just mixed into different neighborhoods, you know, and the one common thing was that none of us had money. We were all broke, so... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like, you know, it, it was like a... Like, you see all these bands, you know, like, who knew that there were so many Hispanic kids into metal in the Bronx, you know, like, uh, black kids, and, you know, uh -huh. like, at the, right. at the time, you know, like... I remember even as a little kid, like, you know, I, I don't know, I shouldn't be cursing too much on this, but like, no, you know, like, you know, like, uh, being into metal as a little kid, like, you know, people from my neighborhood, they'd be like, oh, you're into that, that white boy rock shit, you know, yeah, like, yeah, that's, yeah, sure, that was sure, one sure. of the lines I heard so many times, yeah. you know? but, you know, that's one thing, like, none of us cared about, again, it was all the music and stuff, but, that's right, a, a lot of the bands, you know, always mixed up like if you look at the lineups they're always like mixed up groups you know entirely yeah and and that's one thing like i think also shows in the music because there's so many influences you know everybody pulls from you know their different backgrounds and stuff so that's right 
That's right. And then with the common thread of growing up around, you know, the birth of hip hop and everything else. And, you know, I think it all kind of contributes to whatever the Bronx sound might be. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really, uh, really smart way of putting it. Um, well, uh, well, yeah, thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add in closing? Uh, not so much. I mean, I appreciate, you know, the time to letting me tell my story and, you know, and, and letting all of us tell our stories. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the other interviews and seeing the exhibit next year. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and hopefully, you know, you'll be seeing something from myself and, you know, some, some other guys soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <clears throat>